11, 2017 meeting of the Town Plan and Zoning Commission of the Town of Fairfield. First item on our agenda are the meeting minutes from June 27, 2017. Make a motion to approve. Second. Mo motion to approve by Commissioner Alessi and seconded by Commissioner Francis. Does everybody have a copy of that? Any questions or corrections? I didn't see any. Okay. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? The minutes are adopted unanimously. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to add the supplemental agenda to our agenda tonight. Okay. Motion to uh, add the supplemental agenda, closed executive session to discuss pending litigation regarding 92-140 Bronson Road by Commissioner Lessie. Second. Second by uh, Commissioner McAleese. Uh, any discussion on that? We need a two-thirds vote to add that item to the agenda. And um, Commissioners Grower and Ford, you're both sitting on this uh, for Commissioner Noonan and Commissioner Kennelly. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Okay. The supplemental agenda is added unanimously. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to go into closed executive session at this time. Okay. Motion to go into closed executive session by Commissioner Lessie, seconded by Commissioner McAleese. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstention? We'll go into closed executive session. out of uh, closed executive session. No votes were taken and no decisions were made. No votes and no decisions were made. Uh, next uh, section is a new applications to recommend a public hearing. First is 3135 Easton Turnpike Special Exception Application of Sacred Heart University for conversion of use from office to university use in the design research in R3 zone. This is, uh, Mr. Chairman, the former GE properties. This is Sacred Art's first, uh, their, their application of how they initially are looking to occupy the, the space. Okay. And then the public hearing is required. Correct. Can I have a motion? Make a motion on the public hearing. Motion by Commissioner Lessie. I'll second. Second by Commissioner Kennelly. Public hearing is required. Any, uh, any discussion, questions for staff? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Move to public hearing unanimously. Next is zoning regulation amendment, application of the Hull House Group LLC to amend section 12.5.5 of the zoning regulations. Uh, this, Mr. Chairman, is related to item C. Um, at 1960 Bronson Road, there are twin office buildings up in that Greenfield Hill Center. They are proposing to convert one of the buildings, the second and third floor, to residential use. Our regulations currently uh, limit occupancy of residential use to 50% of any particular building. Uh, since there are two buildings on the site, they're looking to modify that to no more than 50% of the total floor area on the, on the site. So it's a regulation amendment coupled with the following application is to do some dormer additions and some renovations to convert uh, the upper floors of one of those two buildings to residential use. Okay. Both require public hearing. All right, so we'll deal with them one at a time. Thank you for the summary. I have a motion on uh, 2B. Make a motion with the public hearing. Motion by Commissioner Lessie. I'll, I'll second. Second by Commissioner Kennelly. Any discussion? Questions? Public hearing is required. All in favor signify by saying aye. Uh, aye. aye. Any opposed? Abstentions? Move to public hearing unanimously. Second, Kennelly. Uh, Commissioner Ford is sitting for Commissioner Noonan, correct. Next is 1960 Bronson Road, special permit application of the Hull House Group LLC for an addition and conversion of a portion of an existing building to residential use in the neighborhood design district. I don't have any other no, than what no, nothing previously further. discussed. All right, very good. I have a motion? Motion to move to public hearing, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Motion by Commissioner Lessie. Sorry. Second I'm by sorry. Commissioner, uh, I'm sorry, Canelli. First, motion by Commissioner Canelli. Second by Alessi. Any discussion, questions? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? 
We'll move to public hearing unanimously. Next is old business, zoning regulation amendment, application of Fairfield Theaters LLC to amend section 30.2 of the zoning regulations regarding liquor permits. And I think here we also need to take a roll on uh, who uh, got up to speed for missing uh, prior hearings. There are, there are five present members that were at the public hearing. Um, Mr. Wagner, Alessi, Barrett, Francis, and McAleese. Um, last time there were only four members here that would hear it, so it was tabled. There are five pending. Anybody else? Um, yeah, I, I uh, notified uh, the chairman by email today that I did uh, view the public hearing on Fair TV on demand. So I'm up to speed. Okay. Why not? Okay. Okay. Uh, the proposed amendment seeks to allow for-profit movie theaters to be exempt from the current 1,500-foot rule for cafe liquor permits. The State uh, Department of Consumer Protection defines the various categories of liquor permits, and this type of permit for liquor service, in this case of a for-profit theater, is a cafe permit. Uh, our regulations require that cafes be offset 1,500 feet one from another. Um, they're not seeking to allow liquor permits in theaters. If this particular theater was 1,500 feet from the next nearest cafe, it would be eligible for a liquor permit. It is not. It sought a variance to the Zoning Board of Appeals and was denied. So therefore, they're seeking to amend the regulation. Um, the standard criteria for regulation amendments include, does time, experience, and responsible planning for contemporary or future conditions reasonably indicate the need for the proposed amendment? And two, has it been demonstrated that the regulation proposal is warranted and would serve the general health, welfare, and safety of the town? You did um, receive a letter from the Economic Development Commission weighing in in support. I think more than anything else, they think it may help you know, potential future use of the community theater, potentially, uh, if that were to be viable. Uh, you did hear some testimony from the theater people that it seems to be a growing trend in the theater business. So that is what you heard at the public hearing. Question for staff? Yes, I do. Um, I'm sorry, again, maybe I misheard when I was listening to uh, the uh, videotape, uh, the video presentation, but I thought very early in the questioning the community theater was raised and there was a discussion about whether it would apply to the community theater. And I thought, listening to that, and I guess maybe I misheard it, that somehow the community, uh, the community there was actually talking about striking out language, if anyone recalls this, but, but I thought it was the, the idea. It, will depend, it would depend on whether that operation, if it is to be, isn't it nonprofit versus correct. profit? Correct. Would, would, what would I recall the discussion was is that uh, for profit was in the language. Correct. And the applicant said, "Well, if you want to strike out for profit, that it doesn't really affect us. It's more there seems to be this distinction." So the state makes a distinction. Okay. There is a theater permit, liquor permit for nonprofits. Right. So a nonprofit theater can get a theater permit. Right. A for profit theater is not eligible for a theater permit. Therefore, they have to get and apply for a cafe so, permit. So why the impact, the idea being that community theater could become a for-profit entity? Well, if, if again, if, if, if it were to be a for-profit enterprise, it wouldn't be so limited. But mm -hmm. uh, that's future speculation. So in, so in other words, if we were to defeat this, but later the community theater was to come to us as a poor, uh, or some version of it as a for-profit entity, we could then reconsider and decide we wanted to support something like this then. Absolutely. If they lost their status or something. So the community theater's situation really... It's not really driving the bus here. It isn't driving it's the bus. Just, Great. I, okay. I, I would agree. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Can I have a motion for discussion? Motion to approve by Commissioner Alessi. I'll second. Second by Commissioner Kennelly. Do you want to start? No. Commissioner, Commissioner Kennelly? What? Commissioner Barrett? Okay. You look like you're ready to go. No, I'm not ready to go. <laughs> Commissioner Kennelly. Well, I want to say, first off, I was impressed that the chairman actually knew that there was a motorcycle ride amongst the games, because I like the game room over there, and so I was impressed. That's a good dad right there, I'm going to tell you that. <laughs> Because uh, I forgot about that, or I didn't know about it, so maybe my kids are getting older. But in all seriousness, um, listening to the questioning, by, uh, especially by Commissioner Alessi, um, uh, I, I found myself concerned. Um, Commissioner Alessi began by just asking broadly, what's the benefit to the community? And understandably, of course, I am a very much pro-business. I want Fairfield to have a diverse and interesting business community that attracts folks to live here. And obviously, a, a theater would be is one, one of the things we want to keep. 
But I, having listened to my colleagues' questioning of the applicant, um, I had a whole host of concerns. Um, uh, I, you know, uh, I assume there will be these adults who will serve the liquor as a, and in this other area away from the concession stand. But, you know, I wonder if you're short staffed or something goes wrong, what do they do? They, it, once you've given a theater this profit center, what are the likelihood that these are enforced with care um, in terms of who serves whom and whatnot? But then there's this just larger question that, again, was raised by both the chairman and the vice chairman, which I found myself in complete agreement with, which is this. Um, you know, at one point I think the chairman asked, how early can you have liquor, how early can uh, you start serving liquor? And basically the answer seemed to be when the door is open. You know, there was like, what about a morning matinee? Well, that is a real concern for me. Um, I could see something, and I'm not saying I'm for this, but I could see something where you might say, um, you know, shows after 9 p.m. or sort of limited to s movies, uh, you know, or something. It's just some kind of limitation. But that's not part of this. You, you probably couldn't do it. Uh, I don't like the idea of more folks drinking at a theater right there. The uh, uh, Commissioner Lessie, you know, Vice Chairman mentioned this business about what about the potential for people becoming, you know, ine you know inebriated or at least, you know, you know, tipsy and driving, you know, their cars right in that area and people are going around. All in all, I think it's a bad mix um, there's only a handful of these theaters apparently that have it. Two of them are in New York. Um, there were no examples in Connecticut. Uh, so, you know, I, I'm, I, mean, I, could be, I, sh I don't mean to speak for the, the chairman and the vice chairman, but at least the, from their questioning, I left watching the public hearing thinking this was not something I could support. So I, I'm not going to. Thank you. Commissioner Barron? Yeah, yeah I, I uh, need the microphone. I uh, don't support this application either. Um, it's a text amendment. We ask when we do this, what are we enabling? Um, I fail to see what community benefit would accrue from this other than to enable one business to potentially uh, serve liquor. Um, you know, I don't, you know, it doesn't really need to clear. Why do time, experience, and reasonable planning need to do this? And, you know, they want to be competitive, but yeah, there weren't a lot of examples of theaters in Connecticut. So to allow one business to get over ahead of the curve, that's not really what we're here for. I don't see a reason to modify our zoning regulations or text of our zoning regulations. So um, I'm against this. Sure. Also, I was surprised to see that uh, the, while the, the Bridgeport Theater next door apparently had earned this distinction, it was actually on the market to be sold. Well, so yeah. I don't know. I mean, to me, uh, you know, I, that's a concern also. So, so they did, um, uh, what is part of the record is, is that uh, there is um, an amendment which the Bridgeport Theater will be able to take advantage of. Um, but then there was a note that uh, the theater is on the market. I don't know whether that's just being sold, changing hands, you Hopefully. know, and it's going to continue to be a, a, a theater or not. But whether it's that theater or another, Bridgeport is going to allow movie theaters, for-profit movie theaters, to, uh, to, to serve, um, you know, beer and wine. Um, yeah, I, I mean, look, you, you summarized it. I was concerned, no doubt. But um, we were invited to uh, sort of survey other areas, uh, other theaters that, um, uh, that had this. And uh, I happen to be in Norwalk, and um, that theater is undergoing renovation. And that entire theater is going to be new, easy recliner, seat service, food and beverage, including um, beer and wine. Um, so I, I, I agree with the comments that um, you know time and experience didn't dictate us thinking, hey, we need to allow you know beer and wine in, in our theaters, uh, and I don't know that it um, promotes the health, public safety, and welfare. Uh, another uh, one of our uh, considerations, um, but I do think that there is something to be said for our town staying competitive and having our theaters remaining competitive with, with others, uh, you know, in the area. Um, I guess the most troubling thing for me was the timing yeah. and the elimination. I, you know, I'm trying to divorce my consideration of the concept as a regulation amendment and the plan that they submitted, the, you know, because uh, we're voting on the regulation amendment. We're not voting on the plan that they submitted. Uh, my concern with the plan was that they were eliminating kid zone, <laughs> you know, um, and 
it's, but the it's party room right you know, but, you know so but that's not really what we're what we're, we're talking about um, I, I don't think there's any way that we can limit the uh, hours um, not based on the proposal that's in front of us I would be willing to um, seriously consider changing my mind if there was some proposal that would have limited the time for uh, service of beer and wine to as you suggest like after 7 yeah. p.m. or something like that um, but that's not that's not in front of us so uh, you know I'm, I'm I am a bit conflicted on this one Mr. Yeah. Francis um, yeah I, I think what you say is valid um, perhaps we would like to consider amending our own regulation in time to certain hours and beer and wine which is different than liquor you know free open liquor bar well this to be clear this is not for liquor this is only beer and wine oh, okay I thought it was liquor beer well the the actual the, the amendment yeah. is just for to a, waive the 1500 foot rule yeah. for cafe permits so for the beer and wine was part of their so uh, informal be, proposal correct. Like they could it actually would be a cafe be a permit bar. would not be restricted this is, this is alcoholic yeah. liquors beer yeah. ale or wine and yeah. with no time limit so I, 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 uh, I misread that I thought it was uh, limited to beer and wine yeah. they, I'm sorry, they were talking about beer and wine they, yeah. they did say that okay. I'm they saying were. our regulations that they're not amending say other the cafe permit would not limit them to beer and wine only Yes, so, Commissioner uh, Magley. Well, I'm not sure I have any comments to, anymore. I, you guys all wrapped it up pretty tightly. I, I, I wasn't necessarily against the idea. I think it would actually be uh, great for the town to have this, but I'm not sure about changing our zoning so much for this one particular, yeah. um, you know, company yeah. at this time. So the time issues. I, it seems to me there are, must be state laws that that indicate or dictate when like it can or can't be served, and that those would apply. Yeah, but th those so those were amended. I mean, you know, liquor stores are open on Sundays now. They are still yeah, open their doors I mean, at 9 a.m. I mean, you you can, I, you might even be able to buy 24 hours. I, I don't know, but it's certainly I uh, regular business hours. I, I guess my point there is that you know when people were expressing concern about this place in particular, you know, serving too early or serving too late, and I don't think we we have restrictions on uh, bars or restaurants in town. You know, they set. They, they follow state law and state times on that, so. Yeah, which are pretty <coughs> minimal. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Mr. Barron. I just question, if this, just so people understand, if this theater or any theater mm -hmm. was not within 1,500 feet of another right. establishment, it would, it, this regulation would not apply to them then? They would be permitted to have a cafe permit today, today. if they were 1,500 right. feet clear of the next nearest cafe. Right. So I just want to be clear that all they're asking to do is to wave that we don't Correct. apply the 1,500 They're not looking to, to the allow theaters to have but can I, liquor can, that's right. currently <laughs> permitted. Right. Right. That's currently right. permitted, that's right. right. Yeah. But they just, just happen to be 1,500 feet from another cafe, to which really. they're not well, eligible to have the license. Here's what, uh, th that only sharpens my, uh, or, or uh, strengthens my resolve against this, and here's why. Um, Let's use the example of the two different kinds of theaters. The community theater, which is essentially one or two screens, ensconced in a downtown neighborhood. It is not a multiplex uh, in which uh, clearly one of the concerns was the Disney movie was raised by the vice chairman almost immediately, right out of the gate. The kids coming out of the Disney movie while well, somebody else is at this. These movies run, there's often not that much distinction. Uh, in terms of the you know the times seven o'clock six fifty when they get out you know you might have a Disney movie that starts at six o'clock but gets out at quarter after eight or something like that and if, you know if you even had a limitation so this fifteen hundred foot limitation that we'd be removing to me is is not something I want to remove specifically because what that probably tells me and this is this is a dispersed area probably one more served by cars that have to drive farther away and drive around that you're going to have patrons who now have possibly had access to to beer wine or liquor as opposed to, um, as the example, the community theater, which is butt up against, uh, you know, other establishments like this and wouldn't require the 1500 foot rule being waived and is more in the fabric of a downtown adult environment that would, I think, be more appropriate. So, I, right. you know, to think about this, but I don't, I don't be, think it's good. To be clear, yeah. though, that the only reason that the community theater would have that option is because it's nonprofit. Right, but if, I'm if just saying it was a for-profit. There are there are clearly other establishments within 1,500 feet, and that the community theater as a for-profit establishment would be in you, the same position as this one. No, absolutely. But well, what I'm well, maybe okay. So I, mean, I misunderstood. I apologize. I, so wait, it, help me here. I'm sorry. It's 
the current theater that made this application is not within 1,500 feet of another yes. estate? Oh, it, it is. is in it is. So we're, we are not waiving that. Okay. Yeah. All right. okay. If they were 1,500 feet clear, they wouldn't clear. be here. They'd, they'd have their cafe okay. permit already. Okay. okay. Well, no, that's wrong. I apologize. Right. And if the community theater was a for-profit, they'd be in the same Stuck. boat. Okay. No, I was just wrong. I misunderstood. So, okay. Which is why we're all talking about whether we should exempt for-profit movie right, theaters right. from the 1,500 right, right. requirement, 1,500 feet. Bad idea anyway. Right. Right. So. Any other comments, questions? My only comment is that when I looked at the tapes, thing that kind of struck me was like maybe this is this is the state of the business now that they're in and that they're looking for this kind of this profit area that they can make money to stay or survive it seems like it what I was seeing was a business that might be you know dying a slow death and so I'm conflicted as well and part of me was like well we prove it they can sell beer and wine for their limit who knows how long they're going to exist and then the other thing is, I'm like, well, if you're only going in, and this is where I get, I'm with everyone on the timing. You go to a movie for 7.15, you have a couple of beers, it's over at 9.15, and you're out of there. It's not like you're staying there all night. And then I'm like, I'm sure there would be a guy who's going to stay there all night and, you know, have six, seven multiple beers. So that, that's, that's where my inner conflict is. So, I, you know, if there was a way we could tailor it a little more narrowly, I'd probably support it. You know, that's kind of where my thoughts are. All right. Well, the uh, the application is to eliminate the requirement of 1,500 feet from the next nearest establishment for for-profit movie theaters. The motion on the table is to approve. So a yes vote approves this. A no vote denies it. Are we ready to vote? Okay. All in favor, signify by saying aye. All opposed? Aye. Nay. Any abstentions? All right. The motion, the uh, application is uh, denied unanimously. Next item is 160 Carter Henry Drive, special exception application of Sloan Motors LLC to establish a facility for motor vehicle sales in a portion of an existing building in the center design district. Okay, Mr. Chairman, the applicant seeks approval for motor vehicle sales in a portion of an existing building. The business model is not a typical automobile dealer, but rather a consignment business for Porsche automobiles. All vehicle stock will be stored indoors, and the applicant indicates there is a space for a maximum of 25 vehicles. No vehicles will be stored or displayed outdoors. The business is conducted on an appointment-only basis. There is an existing automobile service facility in another portion of this site, and there was previously a used car dealer on this premises as well that's no longer there. Uh, the standards for review for special exception include uh, the location type character, the proposed use shall be in harmony and conform to the appropriate and orderly development of the town and neighborhood, and not hinder or discourage appropriate development or use of the adjacent property. The nature and location of the use shall be such that there's adequate ad access for fire protection, the street and the streets serving the proposed use are adequate to carry prospective traffic and provision shall be made for entering and leaving the premises without creating undue congestion. Our regulations do have some additional conditions for automobile uses such as limiting outside storage and display of vehicles and so forth which wouldn't be applicable here because they're proposing all their vehicles to be within the building. Uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals, uh, there is kind of a two-step process for um, motor vehicle dealers as outlined by the state the zoning board of appeals first has to approve a location which they did on june 1st with the condition that all vehicles remain indoors for sale and viewing so even when there's a customer there viewing a vehicle they have to do so indoors until they're taking it out uh, for for a ride if, if they so do so that is essentially sums up what you uh, what you heard at the hearing mr chairman good thank you can I have a motion? Make a motion to approve. Motion to approve by Commissioner Alessi, second by Commissioner Canelli. Commissioner Alessi? Um, I think it was a good application. I think it's a good location for this uh, business. Um, I think it was the neighbor down the street, the uh, who also has a car dealership or repair <laughs> shop or whatever it was, he came in favor of it. Uh, so it was like it was some competition or some going to be fight, fighting going on. He endorsed it. So uh, it fills the space on that property. So I'm all for this application. Commissioner 
Canelli. The real uh, only issue, uh, only issue of uh, contention is, or concern, as I recall, was one raised by um, the chair, and that is, you know, how many times there are going to be folks taking cars off the showroom floor. Um, it appeared that they see this as this kind of boutique business. This isn't a Chevy lot where just anybody walks in and you know can get a test drive or something. So I'm. I think I'm okay uh, as a result of the answers we got from the applicant in that regard, and I uh, agree with everything else that the Vice Chairman said regarding the application. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay. I agree with the comments, and I was satisfied with the uh, response with respect to the test drives. And, you know, it's a high end consignment shop. It's, you know, people aren't going to be walking in off the street, and they're not going to be interested in, you know, signing people up for test drives just, yeah. you know, willy nilly. Um, so. Uh, and it's a good location. It's it's appropriate. Anyone else? We ready to vote? Yes, Motion is to approve. Yes. Before you do so, just a housekeeping matter. I don't know who's voting. Mr. McAleese was not at the hearing. I don't know if he's. Uh, so Mr. Grower was at the okay. last hearing. Okay. Sorry. So you're 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 out. Okay. Mr. Grower was at the last hearing. Good. It would be otherwise eligible. Okay. Vote. Mr. Grower, you're on on this. Yes. Okay. And uh, Commissioner Canell, you watched the tape. You just no, mentioned I was it. Present for you were present. Good. All right. Okay, good. Ready? Uh -huh. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? The application is uh, approved unanimously. Next is 2335. No, 20, it's uh, 3335, right? 23 35. 23-35 Beaumont Street, zoning compliance application of Beachside Estates LLC pertaining to the construction of a 12-unit residential building pursuant to Section 830G of the Connecticut General Statutes in the Design Commercial District. Okay, uh, the applicant proposes a 12-unit residential project on an 11,331 square feet commercially zoned property currently uh, occupied by a two-family dwelling. The units are all one bedroom, and four units will be set aside as below market rate units as required under the statute. There are 16 parking spaces proposed for the 12 units, or 1.3 spaces per unit. The three-story building is proposed with exterior materials of brick and cementitious siding with either an asphalt shingle or standing seam metal roof. The project renderings show a metal roof. However, during the hearing, uh, the applicant indicated that they would accept an asphalt shingle roof should that be preferable uh, to the commission. The Affordable Housing Committee provided comments supporting the plan as the proposed affordability plan is consistent with um, their, their committee's model plan and the location of the development is close to local businesses and transportation. During the hearing, uh, there were several potential conditions of approval that were suggested and agreed to by the applicant. They include that the applicant would apply to the police commission to post one current curbside parking space adjacent to their northerly driveway as no parking to allow for uh, the sight line for that exiting driveway. One of the affordable units is to be ADA compliant, fully ADA compliant. Lease terms for the units shall be for a minimum of a full year with a maximum of two persons per unit occupancy. The proposed new concrete sidewalk will be extended northerly connect to, the, uh, to connect to the sidewalk in front of the adjacent Levitson property. If there's a gap there, they will be on the property line. They will fill that gap. They've also agreed to uh, notify the housing authority of any availability of the affordable units. As this commission knows, the regular standards for zoning regulations do not apply to 8-30G applications. The standard that does apply is whether there is a demonstrated health or safety issue that arises from the plan that outweighs the need for affordable housing and which cannot be mitigated with reasonable changes to the plan. Um, so those are the, um, the issues that were addressed at the hearing, Mr. Chairman. Okay. I'll make a motion to approve with the conditions as stated by staff. And I'll second that motion. Okay. Motion with conditions by Commissioner Lessie and seconded by Commissioner Kennelly. Commissioner Lessie? Um, I mean, for an 830G application, I thought it was, a, it was a good application. I mean, I think we do have to discuss the roof and see what we want to come up with. And if anything, anybody else on this commission has any thoughts or ideas for this building. Um, but all in all, I mean, uh, as far as 830G applications go, I thought this was a well-presented and well-designed building. 
Kelly. I, I agree. Um, for the application and for what it was, um, uh, you know, I, I would you know agree this is. Uh, you know about the best you you can kind of do in this situation um, that isn't really a comfort to the neighbors on Beaumont Street um, and uh, if it does bring us a small step closer to a reasonable moratorium and, and, and hopefully a, a chance to have the opportunity to have uh, a way to um, at the state level perhaps have a think about how we can both address the issues of economic justice but also um, not be self-defeating in the efforts to advance economic justice by perhaps, you know, damaging already marginal neighborhoods by, uh, in, in the way that, in my view, the state statute ultimately does. And having nothing to do with the absolute value that we all share um, in the belief that there is a, we have an obligation as a community to do that. But I don't think we can pass this without acknowledging to the neighbors there and knowing that we understand what is happening in your neighborhood. Uh, there is, you know, obviously a development, a private development that was not E30G that is going in there, also going in that area. The Exide property is going to be coming soon, I imagine, for at some point in the future for development. And it is absolutely evident that the character, the neighborhood character in this area is going to be changing. And it's something that, uh, as we move forward and as the neighbors there move forward, it's going to have to be a consideration about, uh, you know, staying, going, what's going to happen there. But uh, I don't want anyone to think in a seconding this or supporting this that I don't understand the growing evident pressures on that neighborhood. But otherwise, I completely agree with uh, Vice Chairman. Commissioner, you I just want to say, I don't think we had any opposition on this application. I mean, we, I think we had more opposition when the building originally came to us yeah. the first time. Yeah. And the revised 830G application, I think, is better oh, than I the agree. original. Oh, I hate to say, I, no knock we to the architect, but he, his 830G proposal, I think he was the same architect, yeah. was a better proposal than his market rate. Correct. See, I agree. I, Correct. I completely agree. Good, good point. Commissioner oh, Barrett? Yeah, um, obviously. We, uh, need to support this application. Uh, it complies with 830G in terms of um, the affordable housing uh, regulations and component. I will say too, you know, it was pointed out that it actually, as one of the uh, neighbors pointed out, it actually improves some safety issues by actually installing sidewalks where there are none. Um, and I'm a big advocate of pedestrian safety, so it actually improves pedestrian safety. The one thing I want to be sure is what are the conditions, I was going to ask, that, that, are, that we're talking about here. You said we Possible I'll, I'll go through that. Could again. you go? I, you don't have to do it now, but I just want to make sure I understand uh, what conditions. No, I were, think it would be uh, a good idea. Sure. No, I'll, that's, I'll reiterate them. The, the first is that the, uh, the the applicant apply to the com police commission to post uh, a no parking sign, mm -hmm. eliminating one current curbside space because they need to clear the sight line for that site exiting driveway. They okay. have the sight line, but it would make it. Increase. It would improve right. it. Correct. Yeah. Um, one of they've agreed to have one of the uni, uh, one of the affordable units fully ADA compliant. Okay. Uh, the lease terms for the units shall be a minimum of a full year, mm -hmm. uh, with a maximum of two persons per unit. There was some concern that this would become a de facto student rental facility, so they're looking to try to avoid that. Um, the proposed new concrete sidewalk would be extended northerly to uh, link to the uh, adjacent commercial piece. There's a gap. Uh, just north of the property line, they're going to connect connect the dots there. And they've also agreed to uh, let notify the housing authority uh, of the availability of the affordable units when they come online. Aside, and then of course, the, you know, their affordability plan would is, is part of the application. Is yeah. would be. Uh, you don't have to condition that, but that's right. part of the. Those are good, yeah. Because I just had, you know, Mr. Weaver's notes on that too, and I mean, it was, I thank him for presenting some of this yeah. to the commission as well. And uh, those are excellent conditions, and I fully support them. I don't think I have any to add to them. So. Okay, Commissioner Francis. Um, yes, I want to compliment the. Uh, Can you just the speak design, up? The design of this project is is excellent. I, the homes on this street are lovely. And I feel this blends in as, as well as a multi-family unit can. 
and with the safety factors that will be included, I plan to support this. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Ford. Uh, thank you. I would uh, just, I think I agree with Attorney Fallon's comments when he said that this is the type of 8-30G application that maybe the, the statute intended, at least the spirit of the, the language within the statute. Well, I think we've talked about 8-30G applications and how you know, developers have been able to use it as an end around local zoning regulations. But this particular application, I think, you know, really kind of meets the spirit of the law. I also like the, the metal roof. I, I, we got to talk about that. Um, and, and, and finally, I mean, there, it's a state issue. 8-30G is a state issue. Uh, there was a recent amendment that was vetoed by the governor uh, that would have addressed some of these issues that are impact towns like ours. And yep. unfortunately, our, our hands are tied in that, in that issue. But I would support this as, as um, with the conditions. Okay. Very good. Anyone else? Okay. Yeah, I, I won't belabor the points. I agree with uh, most all the comments. We do need to talk about the roof. So, you know, I raised a question about it. I looked at it more, considered it more. Um, I kind of, I go either way. I, 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 you know, it's a residence, but it's in a design commercial district. It abuts, you know, commercial. I want it to fit in. I agree that, you know, in terms of the proposal, it's the most sort of community oriented like residentially you know fit into the neighborhood as it as it can be so do we want to put on a uh, traditional a more traditional um, asphalt roof as opposed to the metal roof and if it is a metal roof require that it be you know that dark sort of gun metal or you know sort of brown metal color so that it's not some other crazy color I remember the, the initial application, I think it was Commissioner Macleese that said something, I don't remember who, uh, the commission said, you know, there's not many metal roofs in town. And I think he pointed out that there was, there was more there than we kind of thought. And if, there are. If, if, if and I ever may. since then, I kind of yeah. drove around and said, oh, there's yeah. another one. This yeah. came up, if, if I may, Mr. Jim, this, this came up in the context of a mixed-use project at 23 Sherman Street uh, that was proposing a metal roof. And there was some, a very similar discussion ensued, and there was, um, I believe it was Commissioner McAleese uh, provided photos of existing metal roofs around town uh, that, yeah, if you, if you stop and really concentrate on it and look at them, there are more of them out there than you would otherwise think. So that was, that was a consideration that you had on that particular project and ultimately decided to go with the metal roof. Yeah. Okay. I don't have a problem with the roof, but I, like you said, keep it the color as depicted in the architectural drawings. Okay. Do you, you want to add that as a, a further condition? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Second, Tinelli. Tinelli. Yeah. You have a problem with that? No, I, I don't. Okay. So the motion's been amended to add another condition that the roof, the metal roof, should be the similar color as depicted in the uh, in the renderings. And that's uh, mo that's an amendment by Commissioner Lessy and seconded by Commissioner Canelli. Got it. So, Commissioner Grower, you're sitting. You did not either. Did you see no, he was there. He was at the hearing. No, he was here. I was you were here. He has no objection. No objection. Oh, oh, no, no objection. No, no, no. You don't. You don't get to object to the to the motion. He made it. He seconded it. You're sitting for Commissioner McAleese. Okay, and you were at the meeting, so you're prepared. Okay. Any other comments? Motion is to approve with conditions. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? The application is approved with conditions. Unanimously. <coughs> Next item is compliances. 201 Black Rock Turnpike. Compliance application of Bigelow T for a ground sign in the design commercial district. Mr. Chairman, I recommend this matter remain on the table. It was tabled on June 13th. I've been speaking with the applicant. They expect that materials uh, ready for the for the next meeting on the 25th of this month. I'll make a motion to yes, table. Okay, Mo motion to table by Commissioner Lessie. I'll second. second by Commissioner Canelli. Any discussion on that? I think that's good. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? It's tabled unanimously. Next is 26 Main Street, uh, 353 Pequot Avenue, compliance application of John Baricelli to establish a bakery in a portion of an existing building in the neighborhood design district. 
Okay, yeah, the address is a little confusing here. I provided an aerial photo. This is the property uh, that contains, um, among other things, um, the Horseshoe Cafe in Southport. The next adjacent tenancy tenant uh, is was a uh, hair salon. What the proposal here is for Sono Bakery to open up a, an outlet shop here for uh, baked goods that they produce in Norwalk and <coughs> sell here on a retail basis as, as a bakery, and also some sandwich items. Uh, 770 square feet of gross floor area. They're not proposing seating, be takeout only. And I would, if you were inclined to uh, agree with this proposal, I would uh, recommend making that a condition of approval. Condition, yeah. condition of approval that the yeah. establishment have no seating. When you introduce seats, it changes the parking ratio. And they don't have the. They would need a variance to introduce. Well, I was going to ask if they have the parking now. They do not. Not. not for seating, but they have enough parking yeah. for 770, 770 square feet of well, walk-up. It's presently non-conforming for the con existing condition. I don't, I don't think there's any on-site parking for both the Horseshoe and the two other tenants. It's been there. It's you know, it's an old, old building. It's been there hundreds of years. The the yeah. the zoning criteria, though, the difference between a, a retail hair salon and a outlet that doesn't have seating. Is not an increase doesn't increase the demand on parking. When you introduce seating, it does increase the demand for, for for parking. So if they wanted seating, they'd have to propose a variance for parking. What was this before? It was a hair salon. So, so what's next to it? House? No, no, no. The house faces. That's why the address is confusing. The house faces Main Street at Southport. The, the the back. There's another building on the property that faces Pequot Avenue. It's a commercial property that has the Horseshoe Cafe, a hair salon, and a, and a retail store called Barbara Barbara. Um, the Salon Grace was in the middle. They're leaving in the Sono Baking Company is looking to go in there. So if you look at that aerial photo, there is a house at 25 Main Street, but the 353 Pequot Avenue address would be the tenant address facing out uh, Pequot Avenue. That's private residence. Correct. Okay. On the same premises as this commercial building. One tax assessor's parcel. Okay. I see the picture was a little misleading because the, the the arrow just goes in the middle of the, the lot. Now I, I was confused. Yeah. That. Yeah. So it is. It is. Conf we were confused as well when they came into the address because we couldn't. There is no address in our system for 353 Pequot Avenue. The tax right. assessor just recognizes one mothership address Nobody if there are multiple tenancies. Right. To be clear, the front door is on Pequot Avenue. The front door of this proposed establishment is on Pequot Avenue, immediately adjacent to the Horseshoe Cafe. Right. And in that letter, they mentioned that the only kind of uh, cooking is to be essentially warming. Uh, right. They can, if you have a panini, they can heat it up. Correct. If you're a roll or something, but it's not elaborate or a, you know, like we really They're bringing this stuff there. Yeah, they're there's no ovens. Thank you. That's correct. Their their plan is to daily deliver, deliver the right. items that are baked in, at their South Norwalk location to this retail outlet. Can I have a motion so we can talk about this? Motion. I'll move. I will move to approve. Motion to approve by Commissioner Barrett's. Second by Commissioner McAleese. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Sono Bakery used to be uh, in Westport over at the uh, J, um, uh, the, the tree, the, 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 the Christmas tree place, the, the, the nursery, A and J's. Thank you, A and J's. I was drawing a blank there. <laughs> so, um, and, and they, it was, a, a, I think, a space that was a little bit too large. They, they shared it with the uh, vegetable stand. They, they closed. Um, so if you know that, it seems like they're planning to do the same thing they did there, but only on, on Pequot Avenue in, in, in the village in Southport. <laughs> they bring all the breads in from Norwalk. Um, there's no ovens. There's no baking. Uh, they got a panini press, but that's about it. So. What's the motion? The motion is to approve. Okay, I would support that with the condition that there be no tables. Right. So we need a, an amendment to the motion to be oh. no no table seating. I'll amend the motion. Okay, Commissioner no Barrett amends seat. the motion. Commissioner Mackley. Yeah, you do. You have an amended letter and a plan that has no that does seating. not show any seating, but it never hurts to okay. just make sure. sure. You're you're, you're Spell okay it with that? Yes. All right. The motion's been amended uh, by Commissioner Barrett's to uh, uh, condition of approval, no no indoor seating, seconded by Commissioner McAleese. All right. 
Any other discussion on this? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? The compliance is approved unanimously. Next item is public hearing. Uh, zoning regulation amendment application of Post Road Residential LLC to amend section 10 of the zoning regulations. Proposed 10.18 transit oriented downtown district. Yeah, and so uh, we, we have to uh, take care of the projector and such. So we're just going to adjourn for five minutes so they can set up. Paul, uh, the items for public hearing, uh, there are two and they are related. So I'll call them together and uh, the applicant can present uh, all in, in one. Zoning regulation amendment, uh, application of Post Road Residential LLC to amend section 10 of the zoning regulations, proposed 10.18 transit oriented downtown district and 333 Unqua Road, request for determination for qualification as a transit oriented downtown district and special permit application of Post Road Residential LLC pertaining to 118 unit residential development in the design residence district. Attorney Rizzio. Is it on? Just check check the uh, check the on button, if you don't mind. Chairman, that's nice to meet you. I can hear you now too. Yeah, you, is, my name is Raymond Rizzio, an office at One Post Road, Fairfield, Connecticut. I'm happy to be before you tonight representing Post Road Residential, its principal Andrew Montelli is here with us tonight, and 333 Uncle Road LLC and its principal Dr. Robert Russo is here with me tonight. This is a project which is um, it's two components. The first component will be a text amendment which to create what's called a transit-oriented downtown district. We believe it incorporates the best of your transit-oriented um, district over on Commerce Drive along with the design uh, residence regulations that basically this this project lies within this pro project is in a design residence zone with an underlying uh, um, zone of a residence a it sits between it's hard chairman I think protocol wise I'm going to try not to go back and forth between the two properties this the regulations not technically is not spite is not site specific so um, I'm going to try and stay to the regulation first and we'll use maybe 330 Uncle Road as a hypothetical example and then get into more detail as, as that would apply because as I said you know we're not this this regulation is a regulation concerning um, properties that would qualify for this for this uh, zone but basically what happened and I'll explain a little bit about how this developed is uh, this one of the there's a property the Knights of Columbus which you all know on Uncle Road uh, this property became available for sale. Our, our clients purchased the property. Um, they thought it was a unique opportunity, a unique opportunity to provide a great development opportunity for the town of Fairfield uh, and something that is much needed. Um, funny thing was the, we made an appointment to meet with the administration about three or four weeks in advance and the, the morning we met with the administration was the same morning GE announced they were leaving. <laughs> and one of the things that came up when GE announced was they were leaving was one, the taxes in the state of Connecticut. Number two was um, the fact that they wanted to put their employees and look for younger people in a more vibrant area and people are more attracted to Boston where they can, where they can recruit uh, talented uh, younger employees who provide a, board, a, a, a bigger lifestyle. So we looked at this, the, the, the possibilities of development of the property. The property is a three and a quarter acre site and um, there were a lot of potential, potential very uh, confrontational type zoning applications that were suggested in types of developments and we decided what we would do is the, looking at what the Commission had done on Commerce Drive which is the closest transit oriented district looking at your POCD we thought this was the, ex the perfect property with which to propose a regulation for another additional transit oriented development district you folks Anybody who travels on 95, I live on the old post road, I can, the minute I get to the end of my street every morning, I can see basically the, the traffic piling up. First it starts on 95, then it starts on the post road, and then it even makes its way over to the old post road. Traffic in Connecticut is worse than traffic in New York. The state 
the federal government, everybody is moving us toward mass transportation. We have a problem in Fairfield. In Fairfield, 75 to 80 percent of our people need to take vehicles or take vehicles to what they need to to get to transportation. We do not have a lot of housing or housing like most areas that have developed downtowns close to their downtown. So we looked at what, you, what this commission adopted over on Commerce Drive and we decided this would, this would, be, a, this would be the perfect place for an additional transit-oriented development district. First of all, in taking you through the regul let's taking you through the regulation, we tried to make sure that this was something that wouldn't pop up all over town. Um, we're proposing a new section 10.18, and basically, it's base it, 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 the, the, the general basic, the general tenant of this says that we're trying to uh, develop a transit-oriented district, so it's a floating zone within a design residence district. So you need to be within a design residence district for this to apply, which means this commission has already said it's well suited for multifamily, or you wouldn't have put it design residence overlay on top of it. And it says to enable the development to be of a transit supportive neighborhood within walking distance of commuter rail transit in the downtown portion of the post road of a scale and design that is appropriate to the existing neighborhood context and to the character of the town consistent with the goals and policies and locations recommended by your plan of conservation and development. I'll take you through the appropriate portions of your plan of conservation and development that basically apply to that. I hand it out to you and I'll, I'll take you through that. I hand it out to you a uh, you'll see with marked up in orange um, the handouts, which are sections of your planned conservation development. It's in our narrative, and, but for, for purposes of this hearing and to keep this not to go three hours, I'm going to just tell you what we think are the operative portions. And basically, first we looked at the first couple pages, which are page, you'll see is page 66 and page 67, deal with what this commission basically looked at when they, when they looked at Commerce Drive. You were basically looking to acknowledge that while population growth in that area may have some negative impacts in a community, the business of transit-oriented and compact residential development will outweigh these and increase tax revenue to the town. Same thing here. I think the, I don't know if the taxes are maybe thirty to forty thousand dollars on on a property like the Knights of Columbus. Um, it could grow tenfold if the project like tonight is proposed uh, were were to be approved. May I ask a question? Is okay, just quickly. Um, one question for you, um, just right off on the bat on this. Um, how do you react to the uh, counter argument that is, if the answer to our tax problems is intense, more and more intensive density of development, especially residential density development, why aren't Stamford, Norwalk, and Bridgeport tax havens in Fairfield County? Why, why isn't everyone moving there because the taxes are going down? I mean, I, I hear this all the time, uh, Attorney Rizzio, so I just want to understand where you're coming from. Well, if, you're, if you're going to present this, Bridge, I want to understand. Bridgeport's you know, problems are, first of all, I'm not, I'm not talking about, but let's just limit it. I'll take Bridgeport out. Why aren't Norwalk and Stamford well, tax havens in, in, in comparative t tax rates and costs for people? It seems like everyone would race to live there uh, if that were the case. I mean. You know, that argument, Let's, did you make First of all, I don't know Stanford's pensions. Okay. I don't know their, their infrastructure. I don't know what goes on. I know that Fairfield taxes have been increasing. You lose a property like GE that goes to a, a, a 501c3 and you lose four, five, you know, million dollars worth of taxes off the tax rolls. There's certainly ways to replace it. Um, I don't know that anybody in this audience tonight will not say that taxes are probably the, one of the major issues in town. Um, I'm basically saying we're drafting this regulation not from a strictly financial perspective, but by a need which exists in this town, uh, a complementary, what we would call suburban amenity, to bring what we would consider luxury housing for in a transit-oriented area, which would be a, a product that this, com that this commission, through its plan of conservation and development, has sought. But I can't address the taxes of Fairfield versus other towns. I can tell you one thing, that the taxes on this property, on the property of 333 Uncle, would probably grow tenfold. I, 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 it was more of a theoretical thing. I hear this all the time. But I do have this second, and, I'll, and that is, um, it, you, keep, you cite here the commerce, you know, the, the commerce Drive area. Uh, when we went through the, the uh, experience of planning and developing that uh, proposal, I was on the commission at the time, one of the things that was evident to our membership at the time, even as we were moving forward, was the fact that the walk shed the area that people could be, make things walkable for, um, that you, the infrastructure for a walk shed, pedestrian bridges, uh, 
sidewalks, pathways through um, through various areas, was at Commerce Drive, and that was terrible. That the amount of and the amount of public dollars that would have to be spent were simply a non-starter. So while Commerce Drive made sense to so we, as, as our previous planning director said, we, that we realized it was eventually going to be developed and move from industrial to residential. We had to get a handle on it. I wonder how in this area you think that there's an appropriate walk shed already in place, or is there, so that when individuals maybe are getting on and off the train to go to work, they can't get on and off the Metro North to go do their shopping for their uh, groceries. They can't uh, get on the Metro North to go to the doctor. They can't do those things. Um, so. How would your app, how would is in the context of this application to change the zone here I, and to change the I, overlay? How, what do you propose to I, improve that? Can I make that? a suggestion? Go ahead. And, and chairman, maybe, you, and, and, I, and I don't mean to be, you know, jump the gun. I think if you let me get through my presentation, we'll get to make a list of your questions. I think it'll be a lot easier to do this because I'm going to do it out of context, and we're going to be here answering question by question and me still having to get through a regulation. Because I may, some, a lot of my answers will be in the presentation. It's the whole reason for the regulation. So we, we use Commerce Drive looking at your plan of conservation development, basically saying, here's the, tr here's the other train station in town. Here's what the town's looking for. They were trying, trying to make that a more of a commercial area. So they built in, you built, when you did your um, transit-oriented district there, you required a mixed-use element. The beauty of the location along Uncle Road or the area that we're proposing in this design residence is that it doesn't need to be mixed use because we have the mixed use component intact. There's 40 or 50, 40 restaurants that can be walked to. There's markets, there's the pantry, there's coffee shops, there's a movie theater, there's a, there's a defunct movie theater, but there's a, there's a performing arts theater that's right around the corner. There is a vibrancy that can be that can be taken advantage of, that can attract millennials that really don't have anywhere to live. I have a 25, a 27, and a 30-year-old, and Fairfield is not the place they would look to live. Not because they don't enjoy the downtown, but they don't have the housing options that they have in a Stanford. They don't have the housing options that go with a town that has great restaurants, that has a great entertainment venue, that has access to New York City, that has access to Stanford, that can go to New Haven all by train without a car can walk, can take a bicycle to the beach, can do all of, take a bicycle to a harbor. I mean, the good news is you have the Audubon across the street. We made a presentation to the Audubon. The Audubon was very receptive of this. They liked the fact that there were going to be residents across the street. They, they were appreciative that we met with their board, had a long presentation before, because we wanted to let them know before we went ahead with this project. And they, they would like the fact that some people will be using them. I've lived in town for 20 years. I think that was the first time I walked through the Audubon. Um, I can tell you, I guarantee there's a lot of people in this room who have never walked that property. Um, but there'll be residents that'll be able to take advantage of it. So we looked at this property and said this would be a waste to put 20 townhouses there. First of all, it wouldn't derive any type of additional revenue for the town. Secondly, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, it's not really consistent when you look at some of the things with your plan of conservation and development. And more importantly, this property is probably one of the most unique properties between Greenwich and New Haven. Andy Montelli, who is a, one of the top residential developers in New England, to explain to you what, what, what attracted him to this project, what attracted him to the town. In fact, Andy's office, I live, I live uh, uh, right across the bridge and 50, 10 houses down from, from this project. Uh, Andy Montelli's office is right next to Las Vegas, Dr. Russo's lifelong residence of Fairfield. So we wanted to do the right thing. There were, believe me, there were many other additional proposals that were looked at. And we decided to come up with something that was going to provide luxury housing, a need that would give people who wanted to downsize but stay in town. People who had a connection to Fairfield. Somebody who's become a, uh, an empty nester and they want to sell their house, their grandkids are still in town, they go to Florida for six months but they have a place that they can still touch Fairfield. They have young people. There was nowhere for, these pe young, for younger people to live and commute to Stanford. So we wanted to create a community. Andy specializes in creating apartment communities, and I'll, we'll, just, we'll get that into our presentation. So what we decided to do was build in this regulation. We talked about the general instances of it. We talked about, in talking about your plan of conservation and development, if you move to the next page, you'll see there's a discussion about travel patterns. 
and that rail is available to Fairfield residents, but access typically requires the use of additional mode. Walking and bicycle modes are limited by distance and weather conditions. We don't have that issue. We have a train station that will be available by walk. Keep in mind, the property at the Knights of Columbus for the last 30 years has been used for train station parking. There's probably a hundred car parking there for the train station as it is. Uh, we've shut that down as consideration to the neighbors at Audubon Village who don't like the way it had been policed in the past. And uh, so that, that, that train station parking, which is, was privately owned and just leased out on a daily basis, um, shows that this is an attractive location, an attractive area for people who want to use the train. We talk about, if you look to page 31, a product, this is all for your planning conservation and development. Approximately 75% of the commuters drive to the station and park, while an additional 15% are dropped off by someone else driving a vehicle. It's very important that people can live and walk to the train. I, can, I do it, and I've got to tell you, it's a fantastic. My kids come live in Chicago, they fly home, they take a cab to 125th Street, get on the train, and they walk home. Kids, when they were younger, wanted to go out in Norwalk, or they wanted to go out somewhere. They didn't have to get in the car. They can walk to a train and get going. Young people, like I said, who work in the city, have the ability to live in Fairfield without sitting on I-95 or waiting behind 2,000 people for a permit at the, at, the, at, the, at the train station. Next, on page 50 of your Planning and Conservation Development, it talks about the, the Town and Planning and Zoning Commission its recommendation resulted in the following actions. If you look, we have in purple creation of a transitional zone for multifamily housing to stem the spread of business uses into residential neighborhoods. And if we keep turning this, you'll see maintenance of existing industrial uses along the railroad should be encouraged and retail development north of the railroad should be discouraged. Housing development may be an appropriate alternative to the area between the turnpike and the railroad if and when existing commercial use is no longer viable. The area we're talking about exists between the highway and the railroad, and it exists between two separate condominium developments. Um, use, uh, use original building elements and use such as clapboard, incorporate, uh, such as clapboard, incorporate clapboard in, uh, into new construction. Use windows, doors, uh, signs, lights, and other building features compatible with the building style. You'll hear that in our presentation. Celan Pather, who is the architect of Beinfeld and Associates, and we also work very closely with Jack Franzen in coming up with the architectural uh, balance of this project. Next, we get to your goals for housing, and I think this is where it's important. You talked about housing goals, and, you, and, and your, this commission said apartment development should relate to facilities for shopping, transportation, school, recreation, and parks. I don't know of an area that more fits that goal, that more fits that description than the one we're, we're going to be discussing tonight. And if you look toward uh, transportation, discourage further expansion of parking so as to become a regional hub. The idea is to not just turn everything around the train station into a parking lot. Let's talk it to a vibrant community. I will tell you the other thing that has been very interesting and supportive, and I'll give you. We spoke to every merchant I spoke to downtown, every restaurant owner I spoke to downtown, was extremely supportive of this. The beauty of Fairfield that used to have three or four restaurants, now you've got an overabundance of restaurants. But we don't have the people living downtown. You can get into any restaurant, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, even Thursday night, now Friday and Saturday nights, because of the abundance of that. And that's because we don't have the people living downtown. And uh, we have a petition that we'll hand in later from basically at least 40 merchants. And everyone I spoke to downtown said they would welcome this type of thing. They need, we need patronage downtown. We need people living here to maintain the services and the quality that we're delivering to everybody else. And I think that's really important. Now we'll take you through the technical aspects of our proposed regulation. Then I'll take, tell you how the project we're proposing fits this regulation. And then we'll explain the project. So permitted use in this is residents of one or more families made up of dwelling units containing no more than three bedrooms. Uh, we'd also be satisfactory with no, no problem with regard to one or two bedrooms. Um, density and lot area. Uh, property quality, this is important. We worked with uh, staff on this and trying to determine a, a, an area of which this would be a predictable type of development and that it wouldn't just pop up anywhere along the rail line because for example, the Commerce Drive property, although it abuts the railroad, to get to the platform is a long way. This project, though it doesn't abut the platform, 
is only 780 feet to the platform. I mean, it doesn't abut the railroad, it's only 780 feet to the platform. So we basically stated, property as a qualifying for a TODD shall consist of a parcel or parcels of land having a minimum lot area of at least three acres, be located within 800 feet of the entry door of the Fairfield Center train station. Why do we say the entry door of the Fairfield Center train station? The Fairfield Center tra train station runs from Mill Plain Road <laughs> all the way under Tomlinson and across. And to try and have a definitive so-called center, we picked the entryway to where you would get your tickets or what you would consider the entryway to the train station. So when you come over the bridge, you make your, you're coming from downtown, you make your left inside, that little building, anything with eight, eight, within eight, an 800 foot radius of that is where we would calculate the, the radius of where these could belong. If it was in a design residence district and if it um, was at least three acres. Um, the maximum allowable residential, residential density shall be no more than 50 bedrooms per acre, which is the exact density with this commission approved or has in the other transit-oriented district. Um, yes? Commissioner Barrett. It's strictly what you said. Are there any other parcels that would, I mean, I, I see your logic in doing that and you're having to pick a point, but are there any other parcels that you know of down there that would apply to? I mean, Tom, I would say, Collins and School might be one. Yeah, but, here, uh, here's, here's the issue with that. I would say, I could say no, but I would be inaccurate be due to the reason of accumulation of properties. So I don't know of a three acre piece that sits by itself within that, within that circle, mm -hmm. but, I, but I, I can't say that somebody could tear down three one acre, th buildings on three one acre parcels and come in with a project. Okay. But it'd have to be three acres. Mm -hmm. and that's how, how big is the Mosswood uh, property? The Mosswood property is probably a little, what's that? I don't know the exact number to that. So the residential, the Mosswood project, if they wanted to do something there, the Mosswood project would apply. Audubon Village is not in excess of three acres, but I would say probably the Mosswood project, which is technically one piece of property, would be in excess of three acres. Okay. And I'm not trying to evaluate that. I'm just saying you've put a lot of thought into this tax amendment, so I was just trying to see. The reason would be make it predictable without kind of letting you dip your toe in, without without me being able to say with certainty that somebody couldn't rip down a whole block and try to apply this. But then again, keep in mind, yeah. one of the things that's most important at the end, this is all subject to a special permit of which your regulations give you anybody plenty of room to hang themselves on. Um, so the applications um, to determine for the TOD, which we submit as a written statement proposing the land use, it's got to be submitted along with an affordability plan, which has been submitted, uh, a conceptual site plan, um, which has been done. A conceptual plan, site plan shall include a legal legend. Basically, most all of the details that you required for your transit-oriented district for Commerce Drive. Off-street parking, we increased from one space for each one bedroom to one and a half space for each two bedroom. So that I think. Um, when you say increased, you're comparing that from to the Commerce Drive. Yes, okay. Commerce Drive. I think is one to one and a quarter. Um, I will take you through the, the, the parking on the project because it, it exceeds what what's required, what, what what is here. But we're looking for consistency with downtown projects. Uh, then you would put it. There's a management plan. Basically, signs have to conform to your sign regulations. Height: no building or structure shall exceed 40 feet in height. Setbacks: nothing shall be more closer than 15 feet from any public street line or 15 feet from any property line. And you can have no more than seven and a half feet of uh, balconies, decks, or anything extending from a uh, a building. The lot coverage shall not exceed 50 percent, and there should be public water. Uh, and sanitary sewers uh, associated with the project. Basically, very comparable to what the TOD was. I probably, you'll probably ask your staff to look at this, so I tried to save you and did a little chart to show you the difference between the TODD, or the DRD, which is the Design Residence District, and the TODD, which basically shows the setbacks, the, um, the density, the coverages, the height, and a couple of things that we tried to think that were appropriate. In the design residence district, we looked at height. 
because we thought that that was important given the residential, complete residential nature surrounding this property. And we adopted the 40 feet, 40 feet of height that we had for, um, that's in the TRD. We didn't believe, I mean in the DRD. The, the TODB, T, TOB is a, you know, the Transit Oriented Development Park has actually a 60 foot, 60 foot of height. So if you look at this, multifamily uses are permitted in all these zones. The density is 50 bedrooms to the acre in both, in both the Transit Oriented Districts. It would be 6.9 6 acres in the DRD. Size, three acres plus. DRD has to be no, has to be at least one acre, but up to 30 acres depending on the underlying zone. And there's no limit on the size in the TODP. Parking, I show the parking where the commission has the ability, it's two bedrooms to the unit, but it can be reduced to one and a half per unit. Um, in the D design residence district, in a TOD, it's gotta be uh, one for one bedroom, one and a half for two bedroom unit, which is, a, in, which is a increase in parking requirement over the transit oriented development park. Height, as I explained, street setbacks, um, side and rear, you've seen those. Lock coverages, we tried to make the lock coverage no more than 50%. And there's an affordable component here of 10%. Yes. I would just say that when you say affordable and design residence zero, I don't believe that's correct. I believe we changed our regulations, so that's 10% also. I think only if it exceeds 10 units, I think. That's right. right. Yes, yeah, so I, I probably could have put that notation. Okay. okay. But that was recent application. In, in any event, basically what the commission has done, when you're looking for anything more than 10 units, commission, you, you, we have to apply it a 10% affordable. Okay. Um, in, in, in that district, because it's, you could have one acre and 6.9 units, you wouldn't have, seven units, you wouldn't have to do it. Right. Um, so that, I tried to, we tried to factor something that took into account the residential nature of the property and its surrounds. Look, it's surrounded by multifamily. You've got I-95, one lot away, and you've got the train station another lot away. So Chris, why don't we just talk about the, the property, if you can go to the next. We've been through the regulation. Um, if it were dark, you would see it in your, in, in folks, in your picture. This is basically the area we're looking apart, which you'll, you'll see north of the, north of the, north of the, par the huge parking lot, which is our downtown. You then have Mosswood. In between, you'll see a little red, which will be the Knights of Columbus. And you also have the um, Audubon Village, which abuts up to the, next to the parkway. One of the things that's important about this was minimizing any possible potential impact on the single family residence zones because this commission has looked at that as sacrosanct. We, I'm sorry. We, we know we have a problem with the projector. It's either all the lights on or all the lights off. So this is the best we could do tonight. It's not visible to us either. Yeah, so you have their hand out, though. I hope you're following. So the, there's, there's one neighborhood that would be approximately close, which would be in Ludlow Court, which is out the back of the, comes off of Mill Plain Road. It's a little circle. It's really inappropriate for people in the audience to be shouting out comments during the applicant's presentation. Every member of the public here is going to have an opportunity to be heard. As soon as the applicant finishes his presentation, you can take as long as you want, no time limits. Just keep your comments germane to the issues that are before us, okay? But when you're up there talking, nobody's going to shout you down either, okay? So please. It's not appropriate. Thank you. Ludlow Court leads into Ludlow Road. Ludlow Court is a little strip that comes off from the high, from the parking lot, break through the fence that takes you into Ludlow Road, which is a, a nice little neighborhood. We did and made sure that this project was designed of such a nature that it would have no impact on that pro on that on that property, on the properties back there. What happens is our the property which we receive wetlands for approval from, the structure that is going to be, that is proposed on 333 Uncle Road is 208 feet from the rear property line. We have a, the whole, our wetlands area is behind that and there's been a, con that we've already received the approval from and there's a conservation easement of, in a strictly wooded area that, will, that, that cannot be touched. 
behind that property, there's a, another section of property that's owned by Mosswood. If you see it in this property back here, you'll see there's a triangular piece of property behind this dark blue shaded piece of property that's owned by Mosswood Condominium Association that, is also be, that will also be granted a conservation easement to further protect the people from the residential neighborhood from any kind of impact. There'll be no entryway over there. There'll be no, there'll be no ability for anyone to access that property. The property, our property will be totally fenced in and secure. And um, all the drainage, most importantly, you'll hear later in our presentation that the town engineer has requested that the drainage, there's a huge drainage problem partially caused from the Knights of Columbus property because there is no drainage on the Knights of Columbus property, that the property flows into the area behind the Mill Plain Road and results in flooding. Town engineer had us redesign the entire project so that 90% of the water from this site will now go out into the stormwater system located on Uncle Road, therefore alle alleviating any possible water problems that could result from this property. Chris, why don't we go to the... What I, what I would like to do next is then take you through the project that we're proposing and then I'll have Andy Mont. Well, you know what? Let me let me bring up Andy Montelli and have him introduce himself. Well, you know what? Let me take you. I'm sorry. Let me take you through our regulation first. So our proposal is for a 161 um, bedrooms. We're, we're told we're, we're entitled. We're coming in for a multifamily project. We would be. We're at 3.219 acres. We would be entitled to 161 bedrooms. We're coming in for a 155 bedrooms. Those 155 bedrooms will be split between 81 one bedrooms and 37 two bedrooms. That brings you to the 155 yet below the 50 bedrooms per acre. That, um, that we are then are required, would be required under the reg that we are suggesting, uh, total spaces required be 149. We're actually providing 192 spaces of which approximately 150 will be underground. Um, I'll have Andy take you through the project, but basically I want to show you how we comply with the regulation. Our height of this building is going to be three stories. It actually has some eaves, some lofts built into an eave area, so you could consider it three and a half stories, but the building stays under 40 feet. What's important to note is that the site where the Knights of Columbus is will be, in effect, cut down so that the elevation of the property will drop eight feet, eight to ten feet, so that the building that is proposed will be about the same height as the current roof of the Knights of Columbus because we're dropping the site. The building will be in length similar to what you have in Audubon Village. Audubon Village goes a little deeper to the west. Our building comes out closer to the road. Que question for you? Yes. Um, the typical layouts of these, uh, the, the units, is there the loft here? has no kitchen? No. Their lofts are part of their interior staircase in the, in the unit. So, so it's, part, it's, that, it's that, like that, a, that, it could be somebody's home. Floor. Uh, what's that? It's another floor as part of the. It's considered, here's, here's, I talked to building, I talked to zoning. As long as it's not a contained wall, it's not considered a bedroom. Is it considered, this would be considered three and a half, they consider lofts half a floor. Um, for example, yeah. It's 40 feet, but we're building in the eaves of the um, of the roof line. Right. So are the lofts separately rented? No. Or no, they, no, no, no. Those, those are only part of another unit. So like the two bedroom might have a two. There may be two bedrooms with a loft. Correct. A right. one bedroom with a loft. One bedroom with Correct. a loft. Okay. So say somebody has a 750, 800 square foot one bedroom unit. Yeah. They'll have an interior staircase. This is only on the third floor where you're right. in the roof area. Um, they would have the ability to walk up an interior staircase and have an area where they could put their office, have an area where they could put, uh, you know, if they're working from home, things like that. Got it. Thank you. The lofts are not separate units. The lofts is space within the third floor units. Very good. Commissioner yes. Barrett. You can sl the lofts are bedrooms, though. Is that correct? They're not, not counted no, as bedrooms. No. They're not counted as bedrooms. No. There's just different living. There's living. There's separate living area that's not counted in your own. Correct. It's days. it's used as a den. It can be used as you know somebody has a pull-out couch. Somebody has a a, a home office. Um, somebody wants a a a bigger living air a living room area separate from the from the smaller living area downstairs. Um, it was a way that we could use the 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 unused roof area that would that that basically we came up with this idea. Mm -hmm. right. 
to create more living space, not more bedrooms. Correct. Well, yeah. I mean, That's why you don't. You, there's no what's restriction. That? All your no. conservation. There is a restriction. You can't. You can't enclose the room. No, I understand. But there's no restriction that it not be a bedroom. No, but there's no restriction that your living room is not a bedroom either. I, I, I mean, that's kind of really what it is. I'm, I'm not arguing with you. I'm just making the point clear that it could be used as another bedroom if someone chose to put a bed in it. Bed, not, not capital B bedroom, Correct. technically, but it could function as another it area could, where one would sleep. And the, other, the, the issue with that tends to be there's oh, no sorry. privacy. You cannot have yeah. an enclosed wall. So it's, when I say it's a loft area, it typically has a half wall, and then it's open to down below. Yes. Yeah, that's why your conservation applications all say 116, and ours says 118, and yet your total count says 118, but the No, let me explain what couch. happened there. Yeah. It was a little We went to conservation, and at conservation, we've been trying to work with the neighbors throughout the process. We've met with both condominium association projects, um, we've met, as I said, with the Autobahn, and coming through the, we had originally had a four-story, four floor, four full floors that we were going to propose. We met with the neighbors, heard the neighbors loud and clear that they had a they struck they problem with the height. They thought four stories was too much. We redesigned the project and cut a floor off, and and that was a full 10 feet of floor. And what happened was was that a 50, 50 foot building? It would have, it could have right. been. And yeah. so you reduced it to 40 and you reduced your proposed regulation amendment to, 40, to 40 feet. So that given, given, and then what happened, it affected the one and two bedroom distributions. So we managed to still keep below the 50 bedrooms per acre, but have 118 units. But our wetlands, our structure has not moved a foot closer to the wetlands. I've talked to wetlands already. It's clearly just an administrative, um, walk through once we figure out how where we come from this step so in other words if you requested changes to a site plan for somebody they would have to go back and wetlands would have to be able to acknowledge that as long as it had no impact it wasn't a problem i've already met with the staff and they've acknowledged our our growth through the original project and andy will take you through this had four floors and had two separate buildings we tried to do a a nice townhouse style colonial structure up front when we shrunk it, the buildings connected. Um, the biggest benefit of this is all our parking, 90% of our parking, 90%, a good portion of our parking is underground, like 150 car parking underground that no one will ever see. Um, I'll have, we'll take you through the site plan. I, I'd like to do it on here, but I think the problem is going to be it's going to be difficult. Well, I, it, 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 it is what it is. So, yes. I mean, as, as many of the slides that can be seen on the screen, that's Correct. great. Like this one is right. plainly visible, but if there are others that are difficult. So, Commissioner Francis, the project, if you look like this, you'll see this as you go through. It used to be two buildings and there was a, there was a, there was a space in between. When, we, when, we, when the floor came down, the buildings connected. When you enter the property, you'll go the length of the property. There's enough. We've met with fire department. The fire department has approved this. We've met with police. They have no problem with this. We are using a upgraded sprinkler system so that um, we don't have any issues with regard to the fire department and access. So all the properties, all the, everybody has enough circulation. The, the full sprinkler system in the mechanical room and everything? Yes, everything. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, no. He's, the fire marshal was very clear what he wanted to see yeah. and uh, was not open for negotiation, which we were, we were fine with. Okay. So in the end, we end up with our rear, uh, rear set, our setbacks are 15 feet on the side. They are uh, 25 feet from the street. They are 208 feet from the rear. Our regulation accord recorded from 15 feet from each side. Our lock coverage is at 40%, 47%, and our affordable is 10%, which will provide 12 affordable units consistent with Fairfield's requirement. Of course, as a condition of approval, and I think Jim was going to send this out, or the plan that's been submitted out to your affordability committee for review and approval, but it, obviously any approval that you would issue would be contingent upon their approval of our plan. Right. So as I understand it, just to speak to speak to that now, the, the affordability plan was submitted late late in the day today, um, and that has not been reviewed yet by the Affordable Correct. Housing Commission. 
So we have a couple of copies here on the table. Um, it's now available at uh, the um, uh, town plan and zoning offices. If anybody wants a copy, it's now in the file. Um, so I, I, I think we will, we may have to hold the hearing open. That's fine. Uh, as a result of that, but um, we'll, we'll. I understand. I don't think we're going to finish. I, well, I, I don't know, but we likely might not finish that anyway. So, Can Commissioner I Francis. Ask one more question since we're discussing dimensions. I couldn't see on any of the maps how long this whole thing is, how deep. I'll have the engineer get through that with you. Okay. It's, I would say it's uh, probably about 600 feet long. Okay. That's what I thought. I thought I saw iterations of 50, 11 times. Okay. Right. Thanks. So if you look at the plan, that's the site plan. The site plan basically mm -hmm. comes in off of Uncle Road. Um, we've made sure that, and Mike Galanti will discuss the traffic with you. Um, and the property will have some visitor parking. You'll come in, you'll have an entryway, and you'll circulate. And then basically, because of the grades, the, build, the property goes up, and then it goes down. And basically, the middle, where the Knights of Columbus sits on that almost a big rock, will get knocked out of the middle, and the building will be flattened, and there'll be about 10 to 12 foot of grade underneath for underground, an underground parking lot, where so people will come around on grade and then go under the under the building to where they'll have up to th there'll be three elevators with which people can get to their individual units. That's really what the site plan looks like. I'm, I wanted to give you an overview. Andy Montelli, who is the developer on the property, is going to take you through his version of the plan, or not his vision, I would say. And then we have our architect here, our engineer here. They'll be short. Uh, they'll be brief. As you, I think we've, I know we've answered all of the town engineer's issues. Uh, we've received approval from almost every department. We've been through code compliance. So they're, they're, other than the architect and the traffic, I would assume the other presentations will be very short. So Andy Montelli, if I can call you up to the... Good evening. My name is Andy Montelli. My company is Post Road Residential. And um, I'd first like to begin by thanking everybody for their time, both the people in front of me and the people behind me. I know it's getting late, and um, I appreciate it, and we'll, we'll try to uh, be quick about this. Um, I've been a developer for over 30 years, um, and for over 20 years, my office has been in the center of downtown Fairfield, in the community theater building uh, at 11 Onkawa. To pass down that way, there's a little red door on the right, and that's mine. It's right next to uh, 299. Um, in my career, I've developed in Metro Chicago, uh, all over Washington, D.C., Northern Virginia, uh, quite a bit in Columbus, Ohio, uh, quite a bit in metropolitan Boston, and in Connecticut as well. Um, I've done about 40 projects, and they range from about 156 to over 700 units. So um, this project falls right in our wheelhouse. This is what we do kind of 9 to 5 every day. Um, so we're very comfortable with projects like this. Some of the things locally we've done are um, 75 Tressor in Stamford, Connecticut, right at the intersection of uh, Tressor Boulevard and um, Washington Boulevard, right across the street from City Hall, in fact. Um, 597 Westport in Norwalk. That's uh, the Pepperidge Farms project. Um, we bought the old bakery there eight or nine years ago and uh, demolished it and built a very nice project there. The Corsair, which we're just finishing in New Haven, 238 units. Uh, Heirloom Flats in Bloomfield. Um, in Boston, the Batch Yard and the Pioneer. And I mention these names because um, developers are held uh, to task these days. Uh, each of these projects has a very robust website, and I am absolutely happy for all of you to check out what we've done. And you'll see the quality of, of what we've built is extremely high. Um, one of the things the internet has also brought to us are reviews, and you'll see the people who live in our communities are thrilled to be there. Um, for the past uh, six or seven years, we've focused on urban projects, urban developments, 
And in that time frame, I've looked at hundreds of sites. This is what we do. Uh, but of all the sites I've seen in Connecticut in that time frame, this is the best site I have found. Um, this site is a textbook example of transit-oriented development. Textbook. Uh, and we've done those in Washington, D.C., in Metropolitan Boston, in Stanford, in Arlington, Virginia. So we know what TOD is. Um, it's totally pedestrian-oriented. gentleman mentioned how important pedestrian access is to him earlier tonight. Uh, I mean, there's a sidewalk from uh, the Post Road all the way up Bunkawa to, to Ludlow. Um, we're 700 feet to the Metro North Station. Within a half a mile, we've counted, there are over 40 restaurants. Half a mile is a key term in transit-oriented development uh, because it represents about a 10-minute walk. It's a comfortable walk. In addition, you have the library, you have FTC, you have Sherman Green there, all phenomenal amenities. And uh, you can hop on your bike, and a little over a mile, you're at Penfield Pavilion. It's a perfect site for a transit-oriented project. Um, this project fills a major hole in uh, Fairfield's housing stock. Um, depending on whose website you look at today, uh, there's between 650 and 730 homes for sale in town today. Now, while all those homes are for sale, not all of those people want to leave this community. Many of them are for sale because their needs have changed. Um, Greenfield Hills, I mean, I live in Weston. We've got a big house, big piece of property. We want to downsize. That's happening everywhere. So the people who are going to live here, should we be approved, are millennials who are going to be attracted to the amenities of downtown Fairfield and the train station. The empty nesters who are going to be uh, trying to sell a large home, want to stay in the community, want to, want to continue the ties that they have here. They'll be a big part of our demand. And, um, and then the divorcees. When a divorce happens, another housing, demand for another housing unit gets created. And as uh, we saw at the Pepperidge Farms Project 597, that's a significant part of uh, what our demand will be. Um, the irony for developers is that the folks who will eventually live in our communities are my biggest advocates. They're not here yet. They're not here because we haven't built the project. But um, we are absolutely convinced there's plenty of demand for what, what we propose. Um, this is a very special site. And it calls for a special building. Uh, what we're proposing has elevators. As Ray said, uh, 150 of our spaces are enclosed in a parking garage and heated. And it has a tremendous amenity package. People who move in these communities want to, want to form social connections. And we give them the means to do that. Uh, we have a gym that will, that will surpass um, the YMCA, including strength, cardio, elliptical, treadmill, stairmasters, uh, dedicated yoga rooms, dedicated Peloton studio piped into New York City. Um, I'm going, to, I'm going to be quick today, so I'm going to uh, introduce uh, our architect, Seelan Pather, from Vinefield Architects in Norwalk. Seelan and I have done four projects together, and uh, they're a phenomenal firm. Um, as Ray says, we also consulted closely with Jack Franzen on this, and so his hands are on this design as well. Um, I'll turn it over to Seelan, and obviously we're here for any questions that, that may arise. May I ask? Yep. Commissioner Canale. Thanks very much for your um, time and, um, you know, a compliment to you as well. You know, obviously every development project requires a level of imagination and commitment. So I just want to mention that. But you said that you live in Weston. Is that that's correct? Um, I'm just wondering from your perspective as a developer, what you envision as someone who lives closer to Fairfield but not in Fairfield, is the vision in your mind of the future of Fairfield, especially downtown Fairfield, 
that it will serve as sort of the metropolitan destination, the um, new sort of uh, denser location for folks who are going to come down from Weston to take advantage of restaurants and then this kind of a culture. Um, you know, because my worry for inside Fairfield is whether or not we can sustain the community inside it can sustain it. But is that your vision for when you think about developing a, you know, a district like this? that around our train stations, kind of a mini Boston that would be appropriate uh, for this kind of development is what f this part of Fairfield should become to serve the larger uh, uh, Fairfield uh, County area, Weston, Westport, uh, Easton. Is that what you, you envision this area being since you work down there? What do you think? Well, I, th I don't know if, if you'll ever allow Fairfield to grow to that size, but I can tell you there's plenty of demand. And nationally and internationally, a very clear uh, trend in urban planning is the densification of, of communities. Right. Uh, not just um, major cities, but any place that has a strong downtown, uh, there's an attraction from, from different age groups, the millennials as well as the empty nesters. And downtown Fairfield is as good as it gets in Fairfield County, maybe in the state. So, yeah, what, what's been created here, I think, uh, is really in demand. Let me ask you one other question. You say uh, density and what I would think of as interesting must go hand in hand. But it strikes me that Fairfield is unique in that it has a fairly, for its suburban community, uh, densely developed beach area, for example, where the lots are very tiny. They're you know, t anywhere from 0 .15, 0 0.15 to 0.20. Um, so there is already a fairly significant dense, uh, for a suburban area, densely packed um, residential community, say, below the post road that has served this uh, you know, strip for you know, 100 years. Um, so I guess my, what I'm asking you is, is does making Fairfield's downtown more interesting with more restaurants and more amenities and everything else require that we essentially uh, ring the areas around the trains here in town with a lots of multifamily? Do we have to do that to have an interesting downtown in Fairfield from your perspective? I mean, do we need it? Because I mean, you said it seems like we'd have to get the density to really do that. I don't know. No, I think, I think what, we're, what we're getting at is not that we're looking there's, your plan of conservation development calls for the type of development you want around a transit-oriented area. You're trying to reduce the number of cars. You're trying to reduce. You're trying to make the town more walkable. Pull your microphone up. You're trying to. You, you've create. We've created a tremendous downtown, and this commission is a great, has a lot to do with that. I mean, um, when you see from the the old Fairfield store, which everybody was so upset about, and I can remember the the controversy over turning that into. Uh, what developed on the corner there, and now how, the, that, how that has led to a whole re, 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 revitalization of the Fairfield downtown. So what you, what you have now is you have a beautiful downtown. You want people to support it. You want them to support it more than a couple nights a week. And then also you have a need, I think, what, what, in talking to Andy about this, is what you're going to see is people who are connected to Fairfield, myself. I have kids that live out of town. I have a larger house. I want to stay in town. I want to stay connected to Fairfield. This is a place that would be great for me where I could take a train in. My kids want to be able to come back here and live. There's a, there's a community, a, a, a rental community. I apologize for live. being unclear, at Council, and, and I want you to move on. And so I apologize, and I appreciate the Chairman's indulgence. But the question I'm not asking isn't, wouldn't it be cool to have somehow live near the train in Fairfield? I guess my question more is, is, is someone who's been 30 years in this work uh, for your, your client, is what happens to the rest of Fairfield outside of this newly created? This is the, the future vision. You're asking us to look at our laws and steer a course. It will be your development that will be the pioneer. But you acknowledge that the possibility of consolidation is there. And I will tell you, having sat on this commission and watched all sorts of surprising single-family homes jam together to create all sorts of stuff, I'm asking your client, What's the future for the 10 or 12 or 13,000 single family households that are not in downtown but have been long served by it that already are, the folks are already aggressively unhappy with how hard it is to go downtown? If you ask us to go as a commission in this direction, 
I'm asking your client, what is the fate of the remainder of Fairfield? How, are there other communities where the suburban ring around this greater density, which you say is required to make downtown Fairfield more interesting, how do they do? Does traffic end up backing up Unqua as we become more and more dense and more popular downtown? Well, our, to, our traffic you know, engineer is here, sir. Oh, and, no, no, I'm, Mike, talking about this, yeah. I'm not talking about this. I mean, I, I know, the, don't worry, I know what your traffic engineer is going to say. I've been on this commission 10 years. I know. I'm prepared. But here's what I'm asking you. You're really asking us, by your, the approach here, to set a new course, to set a new course, one in which density in the downtown is is a goal. You're saying our, our plan of conservation development calls for it. I'm asking you, can you cite me some examples where suburban communities have intently densified their shopping strips that before served the suburban community and the, re the results have been positive and point yeah, to those. There, so there are examples. There are example, right. Urban Land Institute is sort of the real estate think tank and there are many examples uh, in their research of towns that have uh, had multifamily built downtown and the town hasn't diminished. Avalon Bay, a competitor of mine, built in downtown Darien. They built in downtown New Canaan. Those projects have been well received. They haven't been um, uh, a blight to the town, and they've provided uh, additional demand for the downtown merchants. Those are two examples that come to mind very quickly. West Hartford, Connecticut, very similar town to here, uh, both in terms of population and demographics built Blueback Square, which revitalized downtown, and that contains housing, it contains retail, it contains Whole Foods, it contains a lot of stuff on a very small property. Um, there are a number of places that have done this. There is no evidence, sir, that, um, that this devalues a community. It just provides an opportunity for people who live in a different type of housing in town to relocate closer to downtown. You know, one more. Okay, so yeah. you got one, one more. I know you got to keep moving, but we had a, maybe we had a, we had a queue here. We got to keep moving along. We, we, we had a queue. Oh, we did. Somebody yep. else. I'm sorry. Yep. Yep. Go ahead, so, right. Commissioner right. Lessie. Mr. Montelli, thank you very much. Um, and looking at your north and south elevations, I, I have a problem with this building. To, to me, it looks more like a housing complex than than a. Uh, an upscale apartment type of, of building to me. Now, and I'm, honestly, I'm quite surprised with the owner of this project, who is a Fairfield resident, because last month or two months ago, we just had a six acre parcel in town being developed by a Fairfield resident with, I think, less than half the amount of units you're proposing here. Uh, double the size of the parcel. He offered uh, a park, public walkways, um, a pool. Uh, you know, you speak of amenities. I don't think a Peloton bike for 118 units is an amenity. Um, there's no parks, there's no swings, there's no courtyards, there's no pools. I don't see any of that here. What I see here is let's see how many units we can get on three acres. You're six shy, you said, of what you're allowed. But you put on 118 apartments and didn't offer anybody here any amenities except walk to a restaurant in downtown Fairfield. To me, this doesn't seem like a real thought out, well done project. This seems to me, let's see how many apartments we can get on three acres. And I gotta be honest with you, looking at it, I'm not feeling it, to be honest with you. I didn't know if he was going to respond to you. I'm not sure what the question yeah. was. Is that, well, that's well, I will tell you so. That you haven't seen the other projects. You know, yeah. types of projects. One's a home ownership project with the units are much larger. It caters to a different type of uh, uh, housing need, and it's a whole it's a whole I different type of project. It's certainly not a yeah. transit oriented project. It's a project. Well, that's it was presented to us as a transit oriented project because it was presented to us as walking distance to the train station as well too. Well, it's walking distance to, it, it's, a, it's a lot longer walk than what you have here. Uh, it's more than what we have here, yeah, I would agree with yes. that. It's a whole different type of project that's not, that we think is a, that addresses a different type of need. That but is why there wasn't any thought put into, let's cut back the size of the building and let's add more amenities and make it more attractive to Fairfield than 
let's see how many units we can put on the property. There, there, was, a, there, was, a, there was a lot of looking people looking at the site for a much denser project. We tried to come in with a project that was similar to the transit-oriented type of project that you've already approved in what I would consider a very similar area, which from meaning that we're in a between we're in a multi-family residential district between the highway and the train station, and we propose a regulation that would be similar to what this commission um, has already approved on a similar sized property with a similar density and was very well received. It was similar, but it offered more amenities like a blue side pool. There be, it yeah. offered uh, mixed use. We have um, retail on the first floor, which on your letter here on land use, you have highlighted land uses. Below it says the neighborhood within easy walking distance to other train stations should be mixed with multiple uses on each parcel and within each structure where appropriate to force the neighborhood character. Well, so we had a mixture in that, in that building. We, I agree. And we made the determination that, you, first of all, from a planning perspective, that, that, that Uncle Road really was not somewhere where you'd want to attract a retail element. There was enough retail within walking distance. At Commerce Drive, you don't have really retail within walking distance. You don't have 40 to 50 restaurants within walking distance. You don't have the performing arts within walking distance. You have all that here. So that is one of the beauties we thought of this project is that you don't have to create the additional traffic that didn't concern you on Commerce Drive that would concern you greatly here if we put a retail element here. And That's also, a, there's a I, big difference. And, and also, sir, uh, just to address your, another comment you made, the frontage is very narrow on this site. The, the building is long, but it's not seen from Uncle Road that way. It would be seen perhaps from our neighbors, although we'll be well landscaped and well screened. Uh, but Mosswood and, and um, Audubon are about as long as we are. So, I agree, but if we took out the middle third of the building and made a nice courtyard and swimming pool, I think you would add more amenities to the neighbors and have less density. I, I, so I look at this like we're going to put a lot of our cash in here, and then I'm going to, if, if this ever gets built, I'm going to sign, please, I'm going to sign personal notes to build this thing. So I know, I have to be confident that what I propose will work. This project will work beautifully. It's got 8,000 square feet of amenity space inside. We don't need, in order to rent these units, uh, and people aren't looking for pools necessarily. We have a great roof deck. We have a couple of really elegant little courtyards. Uh, we have outdoor grills. We have outdoor fireplaces. We have fire pits. Eric can talk about all that, but no, not everybody you. wants a pool. I, I like to fill mine in. I appreciate what you're saying, but the last developer that came in had six acres, contamination, piles, cleaned up the town property, all but half the amount of units. Different project. Can, can I ask well, you? Can, you gotta go first. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, now, com Commissioner Barrett. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to keep moving on. So I'm trying to make this. Um, okay. I mean, we're talking about 180. I just want to get your perspective. I know Mr. Galante is going to talk, and I understand what we're going to have a traffic report. But 118 units, and you talked about how it's close to downtown restaurants. We're very proud of our downtown area, close to the train. Is there any reason, based upon your experience with transit-oriented development or, or doing it downtown, that these 118 units aren't going to have at least 118? automobiles that when they're not walking around when it's winter time when it when it's whatever and they're not biking to Penfield Beach that you know it's going to add traffic to substantial traffic to our streets you know I understand about peak hours but I mean what can you talk about these these developments which would maybe you know other than the train and thing outweigh that like your experience with working with transit sure. oriented developments sure. and why they might not be driving all over town and just another 118 uh, residential units with with automobiles uh c c clearly as, as you identified and this is this site is referred to as transit oriented development so there's gonna be a lot of people taking the train but not everybody what's going to happen here is that we have a large we'll have a large group of empty nesters living here um we believe folks will be moving from other parts of fairfield greenfield hill wherever into here depending on your age group and your age uh demographic the time that you use the roads, the time that you leave the community and get onto Uncle Road and head either to the Post Road or to 95 or wherever differs. And because we 
have done these projects and we've seen them, we know that we've got millennials who will leave for work early. We have empty nesters who are in no rush to go anywhere and aren't going to leave until 9 or 10 in the morning. And uh, we've got people who are going to be driving, excuse me, walking to the train station. And so the traffic gets dispersed because of the demographic that lives here, or the multiple demographics that live here. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Mr. Okay. We need to keep it focused. We do. I just want to, but we've got the we've got the developer here, so I want to ask a question. Okay. I don't want to dicker with him about what amenities he's going to right. ask me. I want to ask you a question because I'm being asked to change the zoning laws. So another question I have for you is: This is a rental development of 118 units. Yes, have, was there any consideration, since you you know this area, about what the impact could be on the area about a relationship, say, between the university and its students mm -hmm. nearby and this building? You're, you're talking about a building of 118 units where you could easily have these uh, lofts where I know 19-year-olds won't care if they're sleeping upstairs if it's part of some share. What consideration was made to not worry that a big chunk of this could end up just being an extension of Fairfield University's uh, student uh, population? Great, Since I would say downtown yeah, is great, constantly great, howling, howling about, this, and, you know, no knock to the university, but that there's a very yeah. uncomfortable match there. And My, these kids moving back and forth between the university, maybe by foot, but maybe yeah. not in great shape some nights. And I, things like I, I, under, about it. I understand that dynamic. My uh, wife who went to Fairfield U lived on Lantern Point for three years, so I get it. I understand. Um, a project like this, which I didn't say, will have uh, probably five or six full-time employees, and we have very strict rental criteria, very strict guidelines. Uh, we can't discriminate on age, race, sex, creed, any of that stuff. We can discriminate on financial criteria, however, and we take that very seriously. Um, and we will not allow undergraduates to live in this project. It's, I can discriminate and not rent to undergraduates, and I can promise you that there will not be a single undergraduate living in this place. Because the minute I do, that first Saturday night that there's a party, the 72-year-old person living upstairs or the mom who's got a baby, a young baby who's living next door are going to go ballistic, and we don't want that. So we, okay. I don't know. of every unit we have right now, I don't have a single undergraduate, and I'm not going to start now. Okay. So to the extent that we are able to do so, you're amenable to a condition of approval that no undergraduate college students will be renters or owners of any units in the building? How would that be enforceable? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, how, how would that be enforceable? I don't know. I don't know. I I mean, it doesn't seem to work at the them. beach. Pardon me? It, it doesn't seem to work at the beach. Well, at the beach, they're, they're, th those, are, those are homes that owners are using in the summer, and the other nine months they have to fill. And I manage this project. I control it. We own it. And um, I don't know. We can put a deed restriction on for all I care. You know, I'll, 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 let, I'll let the city, I'll let the town audit our, audit our leases so you can determine the we, age of people. I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm going to be very transparent, and I can tell you that won't be an issue. Well, all I would just, in, 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 you would acknowledge that if we have to devote more resources to police, to inspectors, or to whatever else to follow up on this, let's say, Five years from now, it's very profitable. You sell this to another uh, person who owns this, or whoever your investors are, sell it. I, you know, I certainly want to know what the legal enforceability is here, because one of the problems with bringing more dense residential development here that doesn't seem to be getting through is that d residential development brings with it all the needs for services, so that the taxes that are supposedly going to be generated often have to go in that way. So while I appreciate you'll have four or five employees. I don't know if they're going to be there all the time, 24-7, in a 118-unit building. My guess is, is that the Fairfield PD and any other inspectors are also going to have to be part of the job. Sir, sir the, on, the rents you know? here are going to be no. extremely high. This will be, an, this will be an expensive place to live. People aren't going to pay us these rents if they're not satisfied, if they're disturbed at night. Um, we, we plow our own streets. We pay to have our own trash hauled. Our impact on municipal services is very light, and I think that we've spoken to um, the police department and the fire department here, and, and, and that concern about, hey, boy, we're going to be here all the time, just hasn't been raised with us. 
Now, obviously, you can ask them yourself if they think it's an issue, but it hasn't come up in our conversation so far. Just move on. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions of the developer? Thank you very much. My name is Celan Peltham, principal at Bionfield Architecture in South Norwalk, Connecticut. So notwithstanding the previous comments, I'll try and make a case for the architecture. Chris, can we go back to the uh, manifesto slide? Side by side. The side by side elevation. Okay. So the building is three stories with pitched roofs which have lofts bulging to them. The main structure sits for the most part on a continuous below grade, uh, or has a continuous below grade garage. I should mention that the building was originally conceived as two buildings, with the primary structure being four stories. Uh, the client changed that to a single three story building as they spoke to neighbors about their concerns. That might be a reason you see this building as a long building. It's, fi it's 575 foot long building because um, we took the same density from the four-story scheme and put it into the three-story three scheme and the building grew in length. The architecture is derived from traditional colonial forms but with a simplified abstracted interpretation of that style. The architectural elements that should resonate as traditional are the gable ends with the attic windows, the divided lights in the windows, uh, the wraparound ports and the shed dormers. With this architectural treatment, the devil will be in the details. So we will pay close attention to the window and door surrounds, eave details, exposures and clapboard siding, essentially all the details that will make the building look authentic. We've done this in the past, we've done it successfully, we think we can do it again. Um, the right slide, that one, shows the building as it's viewed when traveling north on Unkawa Road. The approach here was to make this frontage of the building as residential in scale and character as possible. This frontage of the building that Andy mentioned will dominate the view from the street and will shield most of the linear mass behind it. We actually reduced the width of the overall building in this area so that the gable end proportion was more in keeping with the colonial massing. So we paid attention to this sort of stuff. More, most of the building is 65 foot wide, allowing for a corridor with units either side, but we adjusted the plan layout at this end of the building so the gable end is 45 feet. And there to there. And it's proportionally better for a gable. We introduced a wraparound porch with a centered front door, which adds to the feeling of this being more like a house, which also helps break the height of the front of this facade. So the base concept, concept here is that it looks and feels like a home with a front door, with a front yard, with a walkway to a stone wall. It's very residential. The left slide Chris, if you can just go to the left side. Talking about this area now. The left slide shows what essentially is the entrance to the building itself, located further down the driveway. This is where, for example, people who are looking to lease a unit would drive in, enter into a, an amenity area. There are two courtyards on either side of this building, and the drop -off, there's a drop-off in front of it. Eric Rains, our landscape architect, will go into that in detail. But the general concept here, and you'll see, it'll play out in the plan, is that this is essentially the amenity. 8,000 square foot in there, and two large courtyards on either side. So here again, we designed this portion of the building to have more traditional proportions. By adjusting the plan layout and playing with recesses, we created a 50 foot wide element with a three window wide gable end. This is more in keeping with colonial forms. So we, we chose our architectural battles and made this element, for example, look like a home. I think it's difficult to disagree with that. Can you go to the next one, Chris, is the overall? So this is an over, overall view of the development. And I apologize, it's dark. I was going to try and point out a few things. Um, tell me if you can't see it, we'll zoom in. So taking you through this, the entry is off Unkua. This is the front face of the building. This is the point Andy was making. 
That's your frontage from there to there. Any view angles are obscured by this house that we paid careful attention to, house-like structure that we paid careful attention to, and you don't read the linear mass at the back of the building. Um, Chris, if you slide down a little bit, please. Uh oh, that's wrong. This area is the drop-off with the amenity and the two courtyards on either side. There's a rooftop terrace that's orientated south. Um, if we zoom in on that, you see a wall-like pergola structure that shields it entirely from the north. Um, zoom out a little bit, Chris, please. These are shared dormers that let in light to the attic spaces or to the uh, loft spaces and a little bit more. Uh, and these are pockets for mechanical units. Um, this is a way we can provide the mechanical servicing of the entire building. You will not see that from the ground. Um, if you follow this drive west, it drops in grade and enters the enclosed parking garage from below. Most of the parking garage, from the majority of it, is shielded from view. It's below grade. Is there a view of the entrance? I don't see a view of the entrance to the parking garages. I have right? that on an elevation uh, slide. We can bring that up at the end. Okay, great. So we plant the materials. We plan to clad the building um, essentially in fiber cement clad out siding for this type of product, uh, product, residential product, commercial product. It's appropriate. It looks like clapboard siding. Do you have examples with you to show the commission? I don't know, but I'm talking about hardy plank, and you see it all over the place, but I can, we can get that. Okay. I just, just to feel and sure. it would be some. Um, again, devil in the details. We can mimic traditional detailing with synthetic materials at the windows and door surrounds. Uh, we use Fipon. Again, it's, it's more durable than wood, but it looks like wood. Uh, we create pastures and columns, etc. We pride ourselves on these details as a firm. If you look at our website, that's what we do. We'll get that right. Um, the roof will be architectural asphalt shingles. The windows are insulated low-E glass with vinyl frames and simulated divided lights. The balcony rails will be painted aluminum. That's a general overview of where we are with materials. One quick question. Um, I, I wonder, this is one thing about the windows. Now, you mentioned the devilers and the details. Uh, well, first, I, want to I do want to compliment you. I think the challenges you faced, I, 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 I think the effort to try to square the circle of the mass of this structure with the surrounding neighborhood, I actually think you did as much as you, anyone, I don't know what else you could do. I mean, I guess if you had more money to spend. But I compliment you for that. You. My question for you, though, is, is just recently, we split 3-3 three, three on this commission over the, uh, the allowance for uh, a residential uh, use above a jewelry store because the windows on Post Road were going to be upsetting to people because they were too big and weird. I'd like to ask you what challenge, what, what because when I look at this, this is a heck of a lot of window, even when in that narrow, even though it's going to be facing the street, there's a lot of windows there to make a colonial building that doesn't look so gargantuan and ridiculous. What are some of the details? Are we going to see, I see these crisscrosses here. Are these four over four windows? So you talk about how you're going to, because that's a lot of windows on a colonial structure. So yes, let me start with why. Okay, and yeah. then I'll tell you, and and tell you what we do. Um, just getting to the technicality of how we design a unit. You, in a one bedroom unit, you have two rooms you have, uh, facing the outside. You have a living room and a bedroom. A two bedroom unit, you have two bedrooms and a living room in the middle. We give each of those, we found success in giving each of those rooms one large window. So people don't feel like living in a shoebox. So that's where we start with trying to make it good for the residents. In terms of making it good for the architecture, again, we don't consider ourselves a pure, this pure colonial architecture. It's an abstraction of the colonial style. Yeah. So what we do is we pay attention to that dimension. And my, my boss, Bruce Pinefield, is, is the this is what he does all the time. This is all he does. He pay attention between that dimension and that dimension. So the spandrel and the column width is the same, and we'll give it window surround, so the proportion of the building when we're done has an elegant feel to it. But like what I was saying here is, is like things like the windows I'm seeing in this rendering, is that likely what I would see from the street? Are those kinds of you know, attractive? I mean, the, I mean it, it looks like you really point. are offering some, at least in the rendering. The renderings always look great. Some yes. nice detailing. Talk about that. Is that in there? Yes. Yeah. So on a typical clapboard um, yeah, good. facade, we would have a header, right. we'd have uh, no sole, we'd have a surround, 
no, ex uh, no extended sill. We have a surround, a five and a quarter inch surround ar around the entire window. So this, these windows that are going to be dimensional in the sense they'll come out a bit. They're Absolutely. not going to be flat against the, uh, you know, the, the ugliest There's thing. Zero is chance of that happening. Gotcha. gotcha. Okay. Are these 12, like 12 by 12 double hung kind of window? Something like that? Um, 12 by 12? Uh, these, are, these are double hung, single hung windows. Okay. And um, I think the dimensions in this is seven foot by four foot. It's down to be corrected in that exact. Sure. Uh, yes, they're low E double pane uh, glass with the vinyl surrounds. Yep. But not, they're vinyl windows. Commissioner McAleese. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, so the fire department went through this already? And yes. Because yes. I'm concerned about the, the um, parking garage and what kind of suppression is down there. Is it, is it uh, yeah. sprinklered? Oh, so I can, t I can answer that question. So we met with the fire department. One of their main concerns was we sprinkle this building to NFPA 13 standards as opposed to NFPA 13R, which is a resident, residential standard for okay. even multifamily buildings. Um, what that means technically is that all the spaces, uh, including concealed spaces between floor joists and so on, uh, are sprinkled. This is okay. beyond the requirement by code, the 2012 code for this building. Because I noticed some of, the, some of the ceiling height in there was nine feet, and that garage has got to be 570 feet long at least. It's, Certain right. points, and I'd just be concerned of being, you know, if there's a car in that far south. So we specifically spoke about how you fight fire, okay. and you fight fire from the three sides of the building, and um, and the sprinkler system here was satisfied. Okay, dealt with that. All right, thank you. And then also the um, I was looking on. Uh, I don't see a sheet number. I guess it's it's the drawings at the back of the set we got in our packet mm -hmm. that shows some uh, retaining walls. Um, looks like they're going to be 10-foot retaining walls in some cases. I'm, I'm going to ask our civil site. engineer to speak more to okay, that if you fine. don't mind. I'll wait for the site. Okay. okay. Thank you. So can we go to the next the plans, the architectural plans, please? So I'll just quickly walk you through the plans. I don't want to take up too much more time. Yeah. So this is the basement. Um, again, you access the ba we can look at the elevation, but you access the basement from the west side. This is exposed. Uh, the great drops as you get to it, so this is a fully exposed basement only at this part of the building. There is a bike storage room. Um, Andy will tell you that that's one of his hugest demands in his apartments. We've done three with them already. This is a, a large trash room with trash chutes, so the residents will have chutes above. They put the trash into the chute, comes down here, recycling and regular trash. It's all collected close to the entrance of the garage. Uh, Chris, we just move down here. This is a vestibule. Actually, zoom out. I want to show the three elevators. The building is, because of the length of the building, we don't normally do this. We introduce a little bit more, please. We introduce three elevators. So there's three ways of residents parking and communicating through the building. Can, is there circulation under there? Um, to go in to the right, I see two so, so 24 ingress, four, egress. 24 foot drive out. Yeah. All the way around. All the way around in the back, yeah. Two ways. Okay. Second means of egress for pedestrians out there. Yeah. Uh, next slide, please, Chris. This is the first floor. Can we zoom in here because we've been talking about this a little bit? So this is the drop-off. This is an 8,000 square foot um, amenity. We did a building for Andy that's twice the size of this just recently, and uh, we had a 10,000 square foot amenity. So by our standards, it's, it's pretty large. Uh, some of the things we provide in these amenities are a lounge area, media room, leasing office, um, Chris, at the back please, zoom out, a gym, yoga, and spin. These are tried and tested spaces. And again, we, we're, Andy and our office have gotten pretty good at delivering what people use. And they communicate the outside to the um, two, uh, two courtyards on either side. Mix of one and two bedrooms at this level. Um, and zoom on, I'm gonna show you one other thing that we try to do here on this side. This stairwell you'll see above, we, we could have done an ordinary stairwell, just an um, eight foot wide stairwell by 17 foot, but we created a, a stairwell with a, with a clear story opening in the middle. The idea here is that we, you re, we feel that residents are gonna use Fairfield as an amenity. We didn't want, want them to walk out of an egress stair. So we created a stairwell that looked more like you'd find in your home. So when they're going to town and they're coming back from town, they walk out the front porch. So, uh, next slide, please. Typical floor, nothing much to say here besides 
We have three cores and a mix of one and two bedrooms. Uh, sorry, what you can notice from, from, on these are the balconies that you can see um, as added amenity for almost every residential unit. This, side, yep. this illustrates the location of the lofts in the roof. So you can tell this is a low roof area, so you can't use it for a loft. But once you get close to the ridge line of the roof, we can fit in a loft. And that loft is fully contained in the unit that it serves. How big is it? Uh, I think those lofts are about 200 square feet. I remember about 200 square feet. Like 20 by 10? Yeah. yeah. Right. I've, got, I've got a drawing I'm going to pull out because John's got. Like I'm going up a little staircase, I can look over. Yes. Yes, so you have a knee wall, a knee wall. And there's like a half wall, half and you can wall. kind of look down. Yes, yeah, so if you're standing in your living room, you look up and you talk to someone, and the other way around. Next slide, please. This is a roof plan. I'm going to leave more of this conversation for Eric Rains. This is a roof deck that he'll go through in detail. This is one of the uh, most used amenities on our buildings. We, if we do them well enough, they get a lot of use. Um, and if you zoom out a little bit, I just want to show those three pockets. And the, these three pockets here illustrate the uh, condenser pockets. Mechanical units completely screened. You won't see them. There's ways, of, and there's ways we've learned ways we isolate them. There are isolation bars, so residents can't hear them also. Um, it's a good way of hiding them. I don't think, I, I think that might be my last one, but if, if you flip. Was there a slide for the back of the building where the, where the rendering of where the garage? Like yeah. You can see yeah, how we it goes right in the back of the building, but I just carry yeah, right to the end. I think, I think we put one in. Right, right, go back one. Zoom in. Yeah. Uh, no, sorry, no, zoom up. Right here. Zoom in. So these are the three stories right. above grade that we were looking at. Those two are your, two, your opening and egress. And what's that kind of inside? Is that a, it's a wall, I guess? This is a parched concrete wall, yes. This is the only place on the development that you see that wall. Okay. Uh, I wanna, so I think we covered everything. Just a couple of technical points. The residential, three-story three residential portion is wood framed. Uh, the garage will be hard construction, steel or concrete frame with a concrete deck separating the wood portion and the garage. Uh, we spoke about the sprinklers. The question you asked earlier, the building is 575 foot long. And at any time if you want me to walk you through a, a loft unit, we have a board that shows that. Would you like me to? I don't need to. I don't have an idea. I, the, the, uh, the layouts are in the drawings. Yep. Commissioner Grower? Um, Use the microphone. Does this Does this building have any lead compliance? So I don't know if we're specifically applying for, le for uh, lead certification, but our last three buildings have because of the transit-oriented transit nature of this building and because of the building materials we use as a fact nowadays will be up to lead standards, lead, uh, lead silver standards. But it's a very onerous process to yeah. apply for that lead certification. It's more paperwork than anything else. So I'm not sure if we're doing that. Yeah, I, I, I also commend you for making it very uh, colonial looking as best you could and for putting the parking below and the big catch seems to be that everybody wants affordable housing. Is there any handicap units in this building? Yeah, there are, the entire building is ADA accessible. There's two, ver there's two types of ADAs, a type A and a type B. Type A is 10%. Uh, the type A is the more onerous uh, version of the ADA. It's more, it's, it's more ADA accessible. The type B is what we call adaptable units. They set up to be adaptable to serve someone in a wheelchair. But, and what does this have? The direct answer to your question, all, of, all the units are ADA units. That's the way the code defines it. 10% of them, 10% of the 116, so 17 units, mm -hmm. so 118, so ni uh, 18 units uh, will be type A and the rest type B. 18 type A, handicap, uh, ADA compliant units. Oh, sorry, am I doing the math wrong? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm an architect. Uh, uh, please. <laughs> All right. So 12 ADA compliant units and the rest are uh, adaptable. adaptable. Correct. Okay. Thank you. All set? Well, one last question. Sure. Where is the snow storage? We get more snow than we get hot weather. 
So maybe that's something else that Lynch can help with also. Okay. All right, but before you move on. Oh, hold on, I got, I got you, I got okay. you. Oh, Are you all set? I didn't get the Commissioner Brown? The, answer on this. No, the, engineer the engineer is going to address that. It's all set? Thank okay. you. Commissioner McAleese. Thank you, sorry. Uh, just related to the number of units, I just off this set of plans, I counted 98, and we, you're saying 118. Where? We have a typical floor in there, so maybe that was it. But let me go through the numbers. I have there in front of me here. I'm looking at the three floor plans, uh, 1.0, 1.02, and 0.03. I'm not including the lofts, and I'm getting 98, just counting the units. So that's definitely not the case. Maybe you're missing a floor on the package that you have? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I'm counting them now, and there's I have 34. 118. I have 34 units on one floor, 42 on the next, and 42 on the next. Yeah, and what does that give you? Sorry? No, it has to give you more than that. Did I add up wrong? Maybe I added up wrong. Sorry. You know okay. what? I think it was my math. You got me worried. Got my developer, <laughs> no, my developer my standing bad. behind me. <laughs> <laughs> Another architect with bad math. <laughs> All right, thank you. You all set? Yep, thank right. you. Commissioner Barrett. This is hopefully a two-word answer. Where do you go? No, no, no. Excuse me, Mr. Architect. You're not quite, not quite done yet. I just don't yet. think I heard correctly. How long did you say the building was in total length? 575. 575 feet? Yeah. So just that's almost two football fields long, just to try to put us visually yeah. in context. Okay, thank you. All right. Does anyone else have any questions of the architect? Okay. Thank you. Attorney Rizzio? We have the email from Ms. Pooley in our in the, in, in file. Okay. Chairman, members of the commission, my name is Joe Pereira, principal for Pereira Engineering and also professional licensed professional engineer in the state of Connecticut. So two questions uh, so far. One is retaining walls. So if you look at the site drawings that are in your package, I'm referring to sheet C2 of 10, which is a grading utilities plan. There are retaining walls located along the southern property line or along Mosswood and also along the northern property line along Audubon Village. The southern retaining walls um, average about three to four feet high, and the high point in the wall itself is six foot. The northern retaining walls, there is a high point of eight, and that's due to the natural terrain of the site. It comes to a natural high point, and that's where we're uh, cutting in. So again, it goes from eight feet down to zero at the ends, and that's the natural high point. Now, as far as snow storage, um, you know, when you first drive in, try and describe it to you. You've got the So when you drive in, there's a big snow shelf here in this area. This is all landscape and lawn area over to the left as you drive in and you've also got some snow shelf here as you drive in further. Now between the edge of the driveway and the retaining wall, you've also got about a three, four, three to four foot wide strip. Um, that retaining wall could probably move south a little bit more, provide more of a shelf if you needed to, but that covers the length of the driveway. And then in the rear of the property, we've got um, a couple of islands that can certainly be used for snow storage here, 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 and then this one. And then you've also got this outcrop or this alcove area here. Again, as the trucks are moving through the site they can easily plow ahead and and, uh, and they have their snow shelves two questions one uh, how will you achieve the uh, drainage that was cited by mr. Rizzio he said that will I know there's uh, stuff for Laura Pooley signed off but 90% uh, how do we get to the kind of runoff this this big rock in the center of this property there are residential homes nearby how do we ensure that what are the mechanicals involved that see to it that 30 or 40 years from now it's not full of silt 
and the property is draining the wrong way. Talk about how you did that. And I have a second question about uh, how you'll achieve some of this stuff. But let's do that one first. So good question. Um, well, let's see. Our original design. So I'm going to be referring to sheet C2 at the grading and utilities plan. Okay. So our original design, we had a large detention basin. Yeah, sorry. Large detention basin. We had a large detention basin in the rear of the property. That was our natural um, intention there because we had a building in the front and our natural thought was to put it in the back. We met with Laura Poole in the engineering department and she said, you know, there's a big drainage issue in the Pine Creek watershed. Um, big flooding problems. Um, and so she asked that we take a look at taking uh, the majority of the drainage from the site and shifting it so that it goes out towards Mill River. Right. So the existing site, you've got, uh, let's see, you've got, I think it's 70 percent, let's see here, 70 percent of the existing site drains towards the rear of the property today. Where, towards where? I'm sorry. Towards the rear of the property. Rear of the property, right. Today. So right. in other words, existing conditions, you've got 70 percent of this property that drains towards the rear that ends up in Pine Creek Water. So you guys somehow are going to go 90 percent to Unqua. So you're going to go well, west. It's, it's actually not 90. Oh, it isn't. Okay, I'm sorry. I misheard. I apologize. So under the proposed conditions, what we did is we went back and we designed a stormwater detention system, right? Stormwater management system here that includes 200 galleries underground, and that will uh, intercept. Uh, let's see. 65% of the property under the proposed conditions will now run towards Mill Plain, and you've only got 35% that heads towards the Pine Creek River. Right. The portion that runs towards Pine Creek gets um, intercepted by the previous pavement area in the back. So that provides some storage, some water quality improvements. And then the previous pavement outfalls into a rain garden that, again, gives you some more polishing and slightly more detention of the stormwater. Um, Runoff. What percentage are you, is you say about 30 percent will be uh, you'll attribute uh, to the previous payment, or is that my, uh, too high? What percent would are, are you kind of your calculations going to the? The reason I ask is is because sometimes these grass creek kind of stuff get can get clogged if they're not right. properly maintained, yeah. and over time, you know, it's an apartment building. Right. That's what we're basically signing off on here is a 600 foot apartment building mm -hmm. next to what used to be I thought one of the well, place I couldn't live without them throwing the you know, chasing the dogs after me, but. Um, how, how much of the percent, was it 30, 35 percent that grass crete and stuff is going to get the drainage in there? I mean, is that correct? The, the rear of the property. That area, yeah, right there where you're pointing So to. this shaded so area you, of the right. pavement is what's pervious. That's, that's pervious. That's so what's forest the pavement. And what percentage, what percentage of your calculations for runoff are, can, are, are going to be attributed to by the, by the, by the porous pavement? Uh, material on the on that site. I'm not sure what your question is, but 35 percent of the site site will, will be run through run towards the back of the property, property, which will be intercepted by the sports pavement, and then it runs through a rain garden before it's discharged. Okay. So I, I think maybe in the end, the answer you're looking for is the net reduction in stormwater runoff well, on yeah. the site okay. will be between four percent and 76 percent reduction in water. Why such a wide variance? Oftentimes we'll be presented with a project where, wow, the coverage area is dramatically in increased, right. and then there's this, this Rube Goldberg system underneath the ground, which gets approved by Laura Pooley, right. and gosh, I hope in 50 years or 60 years it's still working, not full of silt or right. something's gone wrong. But um, why such a variance there? Usually I hear great numbers. Like, why is that so wide? So these numbers are extreme. You know, right. Usually you only need like to a hundred meet, year you only need storm. To meet, you only need to meet zero. Right. We're going 4% below to 76% reduction. And the reason why I see the variance is because we're meeting all the storm events. So your two-year storm, your 10-year storm, 25-year storm, 50-year storm, and 100-year storm, and again, it's all in the drainage report. Right. Um, there are different reductions for right. a storm event based on your pre-developed flow without getting too boring in the numbers. No, you're not getting boring at all. We ask these questions all the time. Okay. So you're so saying it meets the 100-year storm? We not only meet the 100-year, we meet... The engineering department wants you to meet the 100-year pre-developed flows. Yeah. We meet the 2-year, the 10-year, 25, 50, and the 100-year. Okay. Conservation wants you to reduce your 10-year storm event down to your 2-year pre. We also satisfy that as well. 
And that's done with the structural engineering that you've worked out right. beneath the ground. That's, that's with our stormwater management. System. I don't know if this is a question to ask you. This is my second, and I'll be done. Um, uh, there's rock and stuff on this. Is there going to be blasting as part of the construction of this, of this structure? Will there have to be blasting to kind of get this go you know, underground for the garage and blow up the rock in this where the building is now? Is there going to be blasting? You know, there's evidence of And if some there is, is there a plan or something? There's evidence of some outcroppings on the site, but I think in the end you really need to do some borings and figure out what's below grade. And oh, I, so it's not clear yet whether or not there will be need for blasting? or we're We not sure. have a geotech here, I believe, Yeah, uh, that can speak to that. And if um, there is a need for blasting, I assume as a condition for approval, there'll be some sort of um, remediation yeah, or, or well, amelioration we, plan? We anticipate there'll probably be, a, there'll be some, some sort of, some amount of the blasting. Bla All blast the blasting will be done in accordance with the uh, develop the standards by the by the uh, set by the fire department. You have to meet with, provide your insurance yeah. uh, through pre-blast survey, provide an insurance certificate, and everything's got to be done up to snuff. Well, just the reason I ask is because in, as uh, the vice chairman before said to you was talking about this other development, that development uh, went into the neighborhood and is apparently I mean or offered us that it was going to go into the neighborhood and look at the foundations of the surrounding properties and all this. Would that be part of yes, what we're planning? Yes, 100%. Okay. Okay. And, and, and they offered it, but they also have to, they have to do it for insurance purposes. So what ends up happening is you have to provide your blaster has to provide an insurance certificate to the fire department, the, uh, I believe it's the fire department that handles that. And what you do is you buy an insurance certificate. They have to be certified. They then give what's called pre-blast survey of everybody within a certain radius. I, I, I'm with you. The whole deal. Is there going to be piles driven on the ground or no? I, no, I would think it's going to be blasting and we'll be using some of the rock as wall facing. Is that correct? Commissioner Francis. Um, how deep is the garage? I'm sorry? How, what's the depth? Ten feet? Uh, ten feet. And how deep are you going to dig the, on this site? There's, well, there's a, it depends. It's very, yeah. Feet, right? it's, it, it, yeah. Basically, the, the, the lot, and I'll jump in for Joe, is a big wave. Right? Yeah. So it's going to be flattened to the area where you drive in now. Yeah. So the building that you see with the wraparound porch is going to be built basically on grade. There will be no, okay. that first section will have no, under a garage underneath it okay excavation. from the first section back it will be the top will be cut off to go to grade where the building kind of sits up and down and then be flattened down about eight to ten feet and then dig down ten feet for your garage but by the time you get to where the building is to where you enter you'll be entering on grade again does that make sense? Right, yeah. So you're, Built you're, into you're basically the hill. starting yeah. here, you're going up, yeah. you're cutting that off, then you're coming down under that knob 10 feet so that by the time you get around the back, you're just coming directly into the garage on grade. So you don't come into the garage and then go down. Basically, mm -hmm. there'll be a, where the garage opens up and those doors are, is on grade at that mm -hmm. portion of the property. Got it. Thank you. Make sense? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Not the most engineering. Lead. And also, are there any plans to remove the snow? Sometimes at large, large developments, they don't just plow the snow; they remove it after a while. We have to keep because we have 192 seven parking along. spaces available for parking. Mm -hmm. parking is is essential to us for our for our tenants for our tenants also. So, whatever if we if we end up with one of those snowstorms we had a few years ago. We're going to be carting it away like the uh, like the shopping centers do, who can't afford to lose parking spaces for their customers. <laughs> the, good, the beauty of our project is for 118 units, there's 150 car parking that won't have any issue with regard to snow. So we're not ending up in one of those. We, we don't have any of the issues that you would have traditionally, traditionally in like a large surface parking lot. Right. Which, which is really an amenity and, 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 and to great expense. When you, when you design these projects, and Andy, we talked about, when you talked about the type of tenant, the type of cost, the amount of money expended on a project, the difference between building parking underneath, underneath an elevated building and parking in an underground garage uh, is a very significant cost, but we believe that the elements that were designed 
the project that's going to be built warrants that kind of investment for the tenants that we're going to attract. And that is, you now build underground parking for college kids. Okay. All right, very good. I'd like to get Mr. Galante on before we have to finish in 15 minutes. Is he able to do that? 15 minutes? We have, let me pull up. Uh, Who do you have left? What do you have left? I have Michael Galante, our traffic engineer, and our landscape architect. The landscape architect would be important just to describe mm -hmm. the buffering between the sites. Yeah. And Michael Galante, I'm sure you all have a few questions for. Him. Yeah. But if okay. you'd like to hear from Michael first, either one of them can uh, can can either one of them uh, uh, go on? A couple in, minutes. Either one of them. Only one of them. Well, no. I'm saying I'm just trying to make the best use of our Eric, remaining I'll time. Just give a quick overview of your landscape because you have the plans, mm -hmm. and then we'll have Michael. Who I'm sure you'll have many more questions for. We're going to have Michael next next uh, next hearing next meeting. Is that what we, you'd rather do? Well, we have a curfew at 11 o'clock. It's it, well, that, you know it's I, in 15 I, minutes unless you want us to be here until one in the morning. I want you happy. I yeah, well, that you know, one, I want you rested. <laughs> that's not. That, <laughs> so that, I don't think one o'clock in the okay. morning is really in my best interest. Okay. No, it's, we it's can not. We now if you like. No, we have. <laughs> we have. Not get through. We have 15 minutes left. Why don't we? Why don't we do this? Because I think we'll have Eric finish up with the last. And I don't want to rush any of the. You know, no. either either one of them. So I if you're at a natural breaking point, I can adjourn the hearing. Now we're holding it open, guys. Uh, members of the public, we're not obviously not finishing tonight, and the hearing is going to be held open until our next meeting at which time the applicant will finish and then we'll move to to the public hearing when everybody will get a chance to speak i will, I will let everybody know also that can you guys just so that i can see yeah thanks everyone can submit any comments by email all right or or by letter by you know submit to the town office but if you you email the commission at the web the address the email address on the website that gets distributed to all of us and a copy goes in the file um, so you don't need to actually come and wait and testify if you don't want to you can submit all your comments in writing but if you would like to come and speak the next hearing it's going to be on July 25th, July 25th. okay um, yeah I right but July 25th Okay, and uh, judging by where we are and how things have gone, I anticipate that we're going to finish on July 25th. Okay, well, it'll be it, it will be here. The commission would like we can. I know Mr. Rain can be able to get through his presentation in five to ten minutes. Okay. Done, and I know Mr. Mr. Clark. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. We'll okay, everybody, uh, uh, members of the public, everybody's clear on that. All right, July 25th. Um, and the traffic engineer will kick it off then. All right. You know what? We have to unfortunately have to take a, a switch. This. Uh, Mr. Delante has a conflict on the 25th. And, uh, yeah. If possible, can we have him make his presentation? Mr. Galante, in 10 minutes? <laughs> no, not with this. No. Okay. No. So. Um, Figure out somebody to take Mr. Galante's place on the. If, if you can either do that or you can kick it over to the following the following hearing I personally will not be here on the 25th so and I would really like to participate so if it's okay with you and your client to kick it over to the following hearing which would be August 8th um, we can do that as well one of his people do it Yep. <laughs> yep. What about the other guys? Oh, that, that's fine. Yeah, you can do, and then we can talk just before we adjourn about the next date. So, Mr. Reigns. Oh, good evening, uh, Eric Reigns, the landscape architect for the project. Um, what I'll do is walk, walk you quickly through um, the components of the site that you've already heard about, um, how they're formulated and why they're where they are. Um, we'll focus more on, on how they're finished and how they're anticipated to be used and, and how we've um, pro provided for that in the design. Uh, from the frontage perspective of, uh, from Ankoa, 
uh, which is which is along this edge of the image. Uh, vehicular the vehicular experience is that as you turn in and the driveway moves into the property, we we uh, we finish the initial portion of that driveway very much the way uh, you would see in a in a residential property where. Uh, there's a, a, a paver insert into the into the pavement, perhaps a cobblestone edge, with a with a cobblestone infill. So that apron exists here. When you go when you when you drive through there, you're going through a field stone wall that runs the length of the property, and the second opening is for the walkway that Sealand mentioned coming from the front door. Those both of those openings are punctuated with field stone piers. Again, very much like you'd see on a, on a residential property. As you enter the property further and you uh, approach the, the front door of the, of the building, um, if you keep going, which is, which is in here, we're repeating that same paver insert so that, uh, again, very much like a residential property, you have, a, 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 you have a, a, an indication of what would, what would be sort of a motor court. Uh, although ours isn't is is wide enough for the two lane uh, two direction circulation with an area for pick up and drop off uh, to the side of that closer to the to the front door on either side of that portion of the building which which uh, Sealand explained is where the amenities are we have uh, we have two courtyards one to the east and one to the west we we feel that those while they're very similar in their configuration that can, they can be used very differently. And the one to the east, uh, we opted to uh, introduce I'm a fireplace. I'm just going to interrupt you for one minute because I see some members of the public leaving because they all know that now the peering is going to be continued. All of the slides, which contain all these plans and drawings and renderings and everything, are going to be made available on the Commission's website. Excellent. Okay? So everybody spread the word. You can all download all the plans and the slides from our website. Okay. How, how long is that going to take, Jim, to get them up? Tomorrow. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, that, sure. Um, the courtyard to the east is where we've introduced uh, well, one, the, one of the fireplaces, which would be surrounded by a pergola structure uh, that would be over lounge kinds of seating, like, you know, like deep seating, cushions, uh, uh, sofas, and, and chairs, uh, very much like a den or, or or the family room would operate in, in, in within someone's home. Um, the lawn panel that exists to the east of that, uh, we decided that to, to take advantage of, of the configuration and put the movie screen at the far end so that evening movies could be, um, could be played for, um, for the residents and their guests. Uh, there are terraces at grade within both of the courtyards that are separated from the more public areas by uh, by a low privacy fence. So if you're living in that that if you're living in a in a unit that's on that level, you have separation from the more public areas. To the left side or to the west side of the front door, uh, a similar pergola sit, uh, element exists. But on this one, we decided to treat it more like a kitchen. So that's where there would be one of the grills and um, and counter space and 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 the furniture selections that would occur within there would be more oriented to that. Um, and again, there's another lawn panel that, um, that would be um, um, utilized as, as one of the outdoor amenities for the property. And it would have more unstructured elements like perhaps uh, beanbag toss or, the, or games that people would play um, um, you know, in, as, as, as part of the community. The next zone of the site, if you go to the back area, the next zone of the site, which is, um, which is where, you, where you enter into um, the parking garage, uh, from a plant material perspective, is we've, we've, this is where we met with the Audubon Society and then again and with, uh, with other agencies, selected plant material that, function, that serves a function in water quality and some of the polishing that, uh, that Joe had mentioned. So that exists in, in the two islands and then, of course, on the, uh, far, the farthest east edge. Uh, both the north edge, which is abutting Audubon Village, and the south edge, which is abutting Mosswoods, um, is, is comprised of, of evergreen plant material. Uh, we have a slide, um, uh, if you'll go to the plant material slide. One more. Yeah, keep going. No, next slide. 
So this slide, um, which is in your package, represents the, so the kind of plant material that we've specified for the project that would exist on both the north and the south edges. Uh, there have been subsequent discussions with the Mosswood community about adding additional um, of, of, of particularly of one type of evergreen shrub, which we, which we will do. Um, but that, um, there, that is, a, is a supplement to what's been, what's been presented to you so far. Um, so that's really the, the, the components of the landscape architectural com uh, side of the project. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, from the, the illustrations of the plan, it looked like the major part of the paving was a lighter. Is that just basic asphalt? Or is it it, something It'd be a, a vehicular surface, yes. It, it's actually, it, uh, you're, you're, um, it would be a, you're on the roof of the parking structure, so it won't be asphalt. Oh, so it might be concrete. It'll be a, a, a concrete. Oh, okay. With okay. A, that was why a, I was wondering why it was so light. With the surface, the yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Very good. Will, um, will the uh, changes in the plan uh, that were discussed with the condominium association, can they be reflected in, uh, like, say, the next submission, in other words, just so we don't have to, like, go back and then make it a condition, you know, if we could just see that so we have the same sure. thing. Is that just, this is a supplement. Thank you. We, we've generated it already, so, yeah. yes, we can, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? And submit that to the panel so that we can. Okay. We can also bring it to, so you don't have to scan all these in, we'll bring a, a disk to your officer so that you can, you can load those up, right? Yep. That would be very helpful. All right. Thank you, Mr. Raines. Thank you. So what did we decide? Uh, we prefer the 25th. Um, I will tell you, subject to Mr. Galante, uh, moving a couple things around. Um, okay. And we can let you, we'll let you know very okay. shortly. I so mean, right now, we would like to respectfully request this commission continue this meeting to July 25th, and we would grant the commission any statutory requirements to open or close the uh, meeting. Great. Terrific. Thanks. So for members of the public, we're tentatively scheduled for July 25th, all right? Uh, but it may be it may be rescheduled, so you'd want to confirm that with uh, with the office. Okay. Mr. Sherman, through you, do we have uh, ac uh, permission to visit the site, no, if we want to? Um, permission to walk the site, visit sure. the site? Sure. Okay. Uh, no, no problem. Do we need uh, advance notice? No. I, I, <laughs> No, if you if you can step over the if you can step over the chain, you, you're more than welcome right. to enter onto the property. Very if you good. trip, you're on your own. All right, very good. <laughs> I will uh, hold the meeting, hold hold this hearing open, and I'll adjourn the meeting. You're going to be away in two weeks. I.